uh, quite a bit of experience with the aquaculture industry, which is Tony Forshe. So I certainly don't claim to be. If you want specific questions about epidemiology or anything like that, you're in the wrong place. You can go somewhere else because they'll be answered in one of the other talks. Uh, this is more or less just kind of a, it's not really a best management practices talk because we will discuss that um, uh, in a little bit more detail with Dr. Reichley here in a little bit. This is literally kind of just every step of the way. And it's a limiting stress at each of these steps. So whether you're picking up the fish, whether you're dropping them off, whether you're holding them, whatever it may be, uh, just things to consider uh, and hopefully pretty pictures that keeps you entertained long enough. Uh, if you do have questions, like I said, this isn't crazy formal because I'm not that aquatic vet. So if you have questions along the way or if we want to make a discussion of things, uh, be more than willing uh, uh, to do that. I didn't even get to eat my blueberry donut because we were running around like crazy. <clears throat> All right, so uh, no questions, not terribly, uh, and especially it's kind of a, a play between figuring out since boot camp is involved who are technically new and beginner farmers and people who have been doing this for a very short amount of time as well as people who have been doing it for a very long time. So it's very easy to build a presentation when you know that your audience is kind of all on the same page. So some of it is quite rudimentary, but hopefully some of it it's a, at least enlightening or at least reminds you of something that you already knew just may or may or not have forgotten. Keeping fish healthy is overwhelming. And this is the part that makes having a clicker a lot easier. I should have put it on, on, uh, uh, on a timer. Um, Oh, maybe it is on a timer, and I didn't mean to do that. Um, well, when you're first getting into this, of course, one of the first things you need to know if you've never grown fish before, as we talk to the industry and who's already in the business, uh, of course, the OAA uh, or the FFA, whoever's, uh, whoever's nearest and closest to you and that you have the closer affiliation with, but talk to everybody. Um, two of the things I post on here, the role of, uh, the role of stress in fish disease, disease prevention on fish farms. We've got another one listed here. Uh, biosecurity and aquaculture, part two, there's kind of a beginner and an advanced. These are all just extension publications. For those of you who are kind of part of boot camp uh, or want to be and don't really have a great understanding about extension, which is what I do, it is taking that super complicated scientific stuff that the aquatic vets know uh, or, or the researchers know and try to translate that in a language that uh, one is actually, one that actually makes sense, but two really uh, benefits those farmers in a way that it's actually something they can use. So there's plenty of extension publications. Yeah, you got to read, but they're a few pages long. It might enlighten you. So if you are just starting to get into this type of stuff, you've got to start somewhere. And I kind of mentioned that in a little bit, uh, that there are, that's certainly just to read or just to watch a webinar or just to do a presentation and sit here. That only goes so far, but it is a good start, especially if you haven't uh, by far the best thing is actually doing it and killing a few fish and figuring out why you killed those fish. So, it is awfully warm. Um, ooh, that's loud, sorry. <laughs> Should have done it one full sweep. Um, so once you kind of learned a little bit about what possibly could go on, uh, what you might encounter, when you might be extra stressed in these fish and how to limit that stress or crustaceans or whatever it may be, uh, you get into the fact that you actually stop or stock those fish and what all kind of considerations do you have there. Uh, of course, once they're already stocked, then you need to be checking your water quality parameters, whether it be pH, whether it be DO, um, unionized ammonia, whatever it may be, because that's all a part of limiting the fish. Just because they're in there, uh, and if they are at really high densities, not just a farm pond, uh, those variables change quite frequently. Um, and they definitely get to, if you're feeding them quite heavily, uh, that pond all of a sudden becomes kind of artificial very quickly. You got to understand how this, uh, how you keep them happy uh, and limit that stress while they're actually growing. Uh, and it is a factor of growing these fish and hammering the feed to them, as I discussed here in a little bit, so that they can grow as quickly as possible, uh, but not growing them so fast. And Kind of washed out a little bit, but that's just a real bad blue-green al uh, algae bloom on this largemouth bass pond. Uh, they've pumped so much feed to it, and eventually that pond just couldn't handle it. Uh, there's so many nutrients in the water that 
uh, that those harmful algal blooms just all of a sudden took off. I mean, that's a part of it. You've got sunlight uh, and you've got nutrients, you're of course going to get that. Uh, algae growth, unfortunately, a lot of times, or sometimes it's in the wrong form. Of course, as you're harvesting these fish, what types of considerations do you have to have? Uh, these are just catfish. Um, probably turn off another light if I needed to to make it a little bit clear. Um, but you, of course, have the, the orange buckets that everybody uses. Uh, how do those, how to crowd them in such high densities? How does that work? How does it affect the stress uh, of the animal? Uh, you, of course, have a saying. What you can't see is that there are, um, uh, there is a paddle wheel back kind of behind these guys to the side to help press, uh, push oxygen and fresh water uh, across them because, of course, even catfish quite stress out and get diseases. Uh, and this is actually a boom truck for those who haven't seen. So it's on a crane and it'll lift up a big basket of fish and put it directly on the truck rather than having 20 guys hauling fish back and forth. And of course, holding these fish. Uh, and a lot of these pictures do come, actually, almost all of these pictures do come from Arkansas. I spent a little bit of time there in my master's and worked in extension there for a little bit. Um, uh, that's the, the picture on the right is once you've actually grown these fish and you do pull them up, uh, whether it's a small little aquaponic system or whether you're growing uh, millions and millions of, gold, or, uh, of uh, uh, goldfish and you're going to be uh, holding them in a vat for a little while before they're able to be shipped off. So. Uh, kind of purging considerations and things of that nature. And then, of course, once you actually ship these fish, what types of considerations do you have? So I kind of back up a, a little bit and think kind of someone who doesn't really specialize in this, how you kind of translate what, what may be uh, of assistance to us. There are a lot of people with high blood pressure, high blood sugars, um, whether it be depression, heartburn, whatever it may be. These are all types of things that affect us, right? It's pretty common sense, nothing too crazy. You get stressed, uh, acute or chronic, you get stressed. You gotta understand, you need to alleviate that or you're gonna end up having a heart attack at 43 and you're gone, and we don't want that. We want everyone to stay stress-free. It's the same thing with our aquatic organisms, except unfortunately they can stress a lot faster and you can lose a bunch uh, a lot quicker, depending on kind of what that stressor is. Uh, but there are both acute and chronic stresses. It's nothing too crazy. So my acute stress is more like something like that. Um, it's something that's very, uh, I mean, acute kind of says the, the word all in itself. But the examples, new challenges, athletic competitions, presentations at work, yada, yada, yada. That's all something that's happened and, and it's kind of one and done, but it is a very stressful situation. Then if you actually live in Columbus, you have stuff like, bad traffic that you got to deal with every single day, which I don't know how anybody does it, uh, or it might be your annoying boss uh, that's, uh, that's the problem, uh, but that's something that is chronic. It's ongoing. Uh, it's not going to immediately cause you to just all of a sudden croak over, of course, unless you have a car wreck or something, which we certainly doesn't happen, uh, but this is more of chronic stress on you that uh, can really have the most negative effects on us, right? A lot of people get depressed because of they have a harmful work situation or things of that nature. Um, i trying to think of where I, exactly which one I get. Uh, so I kind of back up just briefly is you take this stress in humans and you figure out what's the stress with the fish, right? If you're hauling these fish, that's obviously very acute. I mean, they're, even if they're catfish or whether they're bluegill or whatever, they're side by side, they're rubbing each other, they're rubbing their mucus coat off. Uh, very, very high densities. You're taking them out of the water, which of course they can't breathe. Uh, that's very much your acute stress. You get into more of your chronic stress. It could be that there is unionized ammonia at low enough levels to where they're still eating okay. Uh, they still appear to be growing. They're still producing the waste that you need if you're doing something like an aquaponic system. They appear to be doing fine, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're at their optimal, right? So that chronic stress could either mean that they just end up growing slower, uh, or it could mean that two or three weeks down the line, they end up perishing and you're not real sure why that they actually perished because nothing drastic happened. You didn't lose oxygen uh, or anything of that nature. It can just be more or less that, that chronic pain that's continually bothering them. Eventually, their systems just kind of break down. Oops. I saw a couple of people laugh with Michael Scott. That's good. It's hilarious. Um, so start by doing your homework. As I mentioned, those extension publications, they do only go so far, but they are a great start. 
Depending on the species, you may only have one shot per year, so keep them happy. Uh, of course, that's Don Maloney with Don's Prawns. Um, I'm still new, didn't really culture that many uh, uh, freshwater or saltwater shrimp in Arkansas for that matter. So I don't have much experience with that. A lot of times, uh, especially if you're local, if you happen to kill those fish, depends on the quantity that you kill and the quantity that you need. There's generally enough guys around there where you can get more, right? It, if, if, heaven forbid something happens during transport, you can usually get more if it's not a great amount. However, you get something like your freshwater prawn or your saltwater shrimp that may, saltwater is generally available a lot more than freshwater prawns are, but say you get them in, water quality's off, they're, they're mishandled when they're transported, whatever it may be. If you don't take the time to kind of back up and figure out, you know, talking to the industry, talk, reading your extension pubs, looking at some webinars, uh, whatever it may be, uh, to try to get your hands dirty a little bit or your hands wet, feet wet, um, you may only have that one shot per year. Uh, one, you may probably just lost a couple thousand dollars, but two, you may have to wait that entire year until the next time that uh, whatever crop they are, are actually spawning or, or harvesting uh, uh, those adults so that you can have those fry for later on or prawn or whatever it may be. It takes time to you know, do your due diligence and kind of start in the beginning and realize what you can up front because you can't always immediately just replace those fish. Um, you'll hear this several times a day. I know Stephen likes to say it a lot, so the ounce of prevention is worth the pound of cure. It's pretty common sense stuff. Yeah, it kind of sucks that you're having to do this up front and center and, and you learn a lot, a lot about a stuff, whether it be through here or, or whatever it may be. Um, but taking your time really helps you uh, kind of on the front end, the back end. So I say timeline of events because I kind of try to start in the beginning and kind of work your way all the way up to harvest or transport. Um, oh, and that's the boom truck where the catfish was in the pond earlier. It's kind of lifting them up over in the truck. Uh, superior genetic species, uh, some are certainly more tolerant or susceptible diseases. Pretty common sense stuff. Uh, you know, catfish are fairly, although they do get diseases, they're fairly hardy. Whereas something like the golden rainbow trouts or any rainbow trouts, they don't have that crystal clear water or at least not terrible turbidity or poor uh, water temperature. Uh, of course, you can have a lot, of, uh, a lot of stress factors there and we certainly don't need disease outbreaks. Oh, getting old. Um, I think this is the only one. Know your supplier if you're not gonna grow your own. Um, there are several times where these fish might have been on a transport truck for three weeks or longer just kind of driving around hoping to sell everything that they have, uh, which if they're doing everything uh, like they should be, it's not necessarily very different than them being in a vat situation. Um, but oftentimes you don't properly see that water quality is being monitored, that uh, you, know, you are having exchanges, that they are adding the, you know, if they use, some people use things like, uh, you know, ammonia nitrifiers or ammonia eaters as they call them, or, uh, depending on how long they're stopping and where they're stopping, that they're actually using something that remo removes the chlorine, chloramine, that they've been iced down, things of that situation. Uh, certainly let your supplier know as early as possible about how many or what you need. Uh, you need the highest quality. I'm not gonna bite, y'all can slide up. Um, that's why we wrote this, um, it was just another extension publications, but know when to purchase your feed train, largemouth bass fingerlings. Uh, it doesn't have to just be bass. I mean, it can be anything, uh, but purchasing ahead. Um, if you call, which I understand that, especially if you're kind of in the pond and lake management, you're kind of at the mercy for the customers, right? If someone starts demanding that you need these fish, that's all you can do. But if you can plan ahead as much as possible, or at least look at your records to see what you've been selling, to go ahead and let folks know if it is gonna be purchased out of Arkansas, for example, let them know ahead of time because the last thing you want is to let them know very, very last minute and they're like, yeah, I'll sell them to you, no problem. And they're the last few fish that are in the corner sort of thing uh, and they're not necessarily the cream of the crop. I do understand though you're kind of at the mercy of, of, of your customers as well. Um, but whenever you can, especially as you look at historical records which tell folks a lot, kind of give you a pretty good idea. Say I need, I know I need at least this money, this many, but you know, there's definitely a chance that you know, this, 
contract could come through or something along those lines. It allows you to, allows that producer, if you're not producing your own, to get a head start to know that they need these many. So you're getting them at a prime time. You're not waiting until the last minute sort of thing. <clears throat> Properly acclimating your fish. So you purchase them from a reputable supplier. You've already done your homework. Uh, and now you're ready to stock them and, and throw them into a pond or a RAS or aquaponics, whatever it may be. Take that time to acclimate those fish. Uh, I kind of mentioned already, or not kind of, I did mention that whole an uh, ounce of prevention, pound of cure thing. Uh, that's a very real thing and it's not just involved with fish farming. You know, you take your time and do things right and do your homework things generally work out a lot better for you. Um, you know, what's the water quality? And we harp on that a lot. I think I even give a couple slides in that, but that's just the fact of the matter, especially when they're in high densities. If they're in lower farm ponds, lower density farm ponds, not necessarily uh, all that stressful, but as you start to intensify, pretty much everything becomes a lot more artificial and you can lose fish a lot faster. But what's your water quality of your current water? and your destination or your quarantine water. Hopefully it's the quarantine water, um, uh, especially if you don't know your supplier. Even if you do know your supplier, sometimes the fish may not look like they have uh, a fungus or a disease, or maybe the disease has been tested, um, but that farm's always been clean. Just stressing and moving those fish from one place to the other, a lot of times that mucus layer sloughs off, and now all of a sudden those fish that were 100% healthy become not healthy anymore and stocking those directly into your system is a great way to great way to lose fish unfortunately um, so if you can of course it depends on the quantity not everyone can do that and, and house that uh, area I think I talk a little bit more about quarantine so I won't get into that much more right now but how different are your parameters uh, you know is your pH of the water you're in uh, seven and the water you're trying to go is ten in a pond uh, you dump those fish right over, you're gonna lose them pretty quickly. Um, depends on the species, but some of them are not tolerant at all to sharp pH changes like that. Take, those ti take the time, uh, if you've got a good person bringing your fish or shrimp over, hopefully they'll understand that you need to take some time, unload them into a quarantine area, start slowly exchanging some water out uh, so that you're not stressing them, or temperature. A lot of people chill those fish down so that they're a lot less, uh, uh, that they're not uh, using up as much oxygen and stressing out as much. They'll cool that temperature down in that truck when they haul them off. Well, if they're going from, depends on the species, you know, like 70 degrees up to a pond that's 80 or 85, take a little time to try to match that temperature as, as much as possible so you don't lose those animals. You've already spent a lot of time doing your homework. You've already contacted the supplier. They've already brought them to you. You're literally almost there. They're almost in the system or almost in the pond. Everyone gets giddy and wants to just stock immediately. That's the same thing as if you've got a little saltwater aquarium at home. You go to Petco or PetSmart and buy a little shrimp. They tell you to acclimate that fish or that shrimp or whatever it may be for a reason because people think it's really, really pretty. It's suffering in that bag or it's suffering in that small container. I need to let it free. Unfortunately, you can do a lot more harm than good by immediately releasing that animal into your little aquarium, right? Take some time, let the temperature, if it's a small, a small amount, let a bag float and acclimate in that situation. Open the bag, exchange some water, or if it's in a larger hauling truck, you can do that pretty easily with pumps, uh, submersible pumps too. Um, and of course, a lot of people use salt to, to transport, uh, to help with the stress of the animals. Uh, I showed this picture before um, uh, on the left, but if it works, it works. Uh, that's all that, that really matters. If you can, protect your investment. It's really small, but that stands for Q, or it's Q13, just stands for quarantine. Uh, this was at, actually, the, uh, in the back of like the Toledo Zoo. Uh, they, of course, they're purchasing a lot of fish as they lose or want to expand their aquarium. So they've got these cichlids. Um, uh, just quarantine for quite a while to make sure that they're not going to introduce anything bad or that just the shipping of those fish has caused stress that allows that that basically that pathogen kind of uh, explodes and takes over a system. They're quarantined these for 
probably a couple weeks to make sure that they're okay and that they're fine because it's a lot easier to say scoop from here into their destination than it is for them to to pull those fish from Florida or overseas or wherever it may be. Uh, if you can take that time you certainly hope for something close to seven days because not everything happens immediately. Uh, of course we know that that's not necessarily always going to happen but having a system that is completely standalone from the rest of your system is absolutely vital. It makes absolutely no sense to have a recirculating system with a quarantine tank that's hooked up to the same water that everything else is in. That's literally the same exact thing as just dumping your fish in. Uh, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, have something that's completely offline. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy. You don't need to feed, or if you feed, you read just a couple pellets just to see kind of are they wanting to feed? Are they feeling healthy enough to actually feed? Uh, thump, something along those lines just to, just to make sure. But whatever you do, make sure it's offline of everything else. Um, I think here's kind of where I talk a couple of the, the water quality slides, but once they're stocked, proper feeding, and this is ponds, but it, it means for, for everything, uh, and water remediation is the key. There's obviously a balance, as I mentioned earlier, with the harmful algal blooms the, uh, that kind of took over that pond, where you've got nutrients and you've got sunlight, um, you know, you're going to have aquatic plants take off. So you kind of need that balance of feeding as much as they eat, and this is assuming kind of a couple things, and not everyone, depending on your market, is going to be that way. Some people, they want to feed as much as possible uh, every single day because they want those to get to market absolutely as soon as possible. Um, if you're in something like an aquaponics where it's more or less just nutrient wastewater being used, or maybe you don't have the square footage to actually feed as many plants as what that system or what those fish could actually handle, you may not be at full throttle every single day uh, and if you're checking your parameters and things like that. So this kind of assumes that if you're humping the feed to them every single day, your, your whole goal is to get them from the moment they're on your farm to the moment you leave your farm, you're wanting to shorten that time frame as much as possible, right? It just makes sense uh, for a variety of reasons. Kind of the biggest one is risk. Um, you're gonna grow these fish if, if you just take your time. Uh, once again, it depends on markets and who your customers are and when they need them. But if you're trying to get it as quickly as possible and you get those fish out in say eight months instead of 11 months, when there are troubles, it's going to happen in month nine or ten. And then rather than doing what you should have done and kind of got them out as quickly as possible, month nine or ten, someone's going to hit the transformer out front and it's going to knock off power. Uh, and, you, and you got your generator there, but it hasn't been hooked up yet, uh, and you end up losing a bunch of fish. So you got to uh, kind of be cognizant of that, but we understand it is a trade-off balance. Uh, you feed as much as that system will hold, but if you do overfeed, uh, and that just takes time and, and getting used to seeing how your fish feed, how fast they're growing and things like that, uh, you don't want to overfeed. Um, but if you do, you're certainly just going to end up with uh, a lot of nutrients in that system, uh, which unfortunately can cause it to crash, whether it be ammonia and ionized ammonia or pH or whatever it may be or oxygen. You still got to take your time uh, and kind of use that trade-off. Um, I think all I was getting here is the same thing. A lot of people are, are, are utilizing, yeah, I think it's all the same. Yeah, I think it's all the same. A lot of people, if you're going to hump that feed to them, you better have enough aeration present to be able to, uh, to help support that microbial activity that's un undoubtedly just absolutely booming as you feed these guys really heavy. Of course, this is intensive aeration catfish pond, so that's a lot higher aeration than we ever see. Um, these are definitely more for the, the boot camp folks who just don't have any experience dealing with fish. Uh, so I'll just kind of run through fairly quickly. And if you have more questions about it, uh, we give enough water quality talks or can talk later, whatever it may be. Uh, but temperatures were certainly uh, homeotherms. That means we're regulating our own internal body temperature. We generally sit around 98.6, uh, but do go a little higher or lower. Uh, Fish definitely are not, they, they kind of are wanting to upgrade and not necessarily say poikilo anymore, uh, but all it means is that their temperature, body temperature is varied. Uh, there's a reason you've got warm water fish, cool water fish, cold water fish that are, can only be grown in certain areas. 
you grow tilapia over the winter out, out, outside here, your business plan is going to go to crap because they're going to die over the winter. Uh, and it's just, uh, uh, just part of it. So all that means is uh, if you use tilapia or yellow perch salmon, whatever it may be, it's kind of your warm, cool, and cold. Uh, when they're not in their optimal temperature, uh, they're not going to be eating as much as they could be. Um, and once again, you always try to, at least now I'm in Ohio, at least think about the aquaponics people. <clears throat> there is that trade-off between your fish and your plants. And maybe if plants are making you all your money, your fish aren't 100% optimal. Maybe if the optimal temperature is 83, maybe it's a little bit cooler than that. and They're not eating quite as much, but that's because you need those fish to grow. Uh, but you're really, really worried about the plants, so you kind of suffer to where they're not, maybe not at their optimal, but they're still uh, eating enough, producing enough nutrients and things of that nature. Being outside, you're of course just subject to Mother Nature uh, and experience and actually going out and testing water temperatures and specific species to help you kind of realize uh, what kind of, what your ranges are. Just because a fish is alive, just because it's eating, and I'm kind of still on thunder from a, another uh, I think probably the next slide, just because they're eating doesn't necessarily mean that they're, uh, that they're happy and growing as fast as they can. I just use this as an example because it's a warm water species and it's easy. <clears throat> if the system's too hot, which a lot of times doesn't necessarily happen here in Ohio unless something terribly goes wrong, uh, but say if their optimal temperature uh, is uh, mid-80s or so, uh, but for whatever reason, if I'm in Arkansas and the water temperature is 95, which is actually what we see a lot with the largemouth bass uh, in Arkansas as well. And we talk about the trade-offs. A lot of people don't produce their own bass here because they can buy it from Arkansas um, because they, people do think that they have a longer growing season. And I guess rather than tilapia, I'll, I'll just come down here, but I'll use more or less the, the bass as, a, uh, uh, as the example because I think we did a write-up on it. Just because they do have a longer growing season because they're a little further south doesn't mean that the growth is necessarily going to be that much different. And the reason that the growth might not necessarily be different is because come July, it is not uncommon for those shallow ponds, you know, six feet or less, some of them five, even four if they're older. Um, that temperature may very well, and I've seen it, 95 degrees or 100 degrees. Well, what that happens is that water is entirely too hot. So all they're doing is constantly opening and closing their gills and pumping as much oxygen over their gills uh, as possible just to be able to survive. It's a very, very stressful situation. Um, one of the largest bass farmers in the state is convinced that in about July, for about a month or so, his fish lose weight. Whereas here, our fish would still be growing because it's not got necessarily that part to where it's so stressful uh, he says he can definitely see the feed slacking off uh, a huge amount and any bit that they're actually consuming, a lot of that goes to the cost to survive because they're uh, just trying to produce enough nutrients for their bodies just to survive. So it's kind of on your too hot scale and that's where we use kind of with the bass thing. So here in Arkansas you have to be a slower growing season but it certainly makes sense to me to say, and I think Tom and I have talked about this before, kind of look at the economics of it you know, who's hatching these bass here, look at the actual growth rates for uh, an Ohio specific gene or whatever it may be versus what comes out of Arkansas. Yeah, they've got a longer growing season, but they're also losing weight during a part of the season when they're not, then they wouldn't be losing weight here. And whether or not it's actually enough that it makes financial sense, um, because that's of course what it all boils down to. Maybe it does make sense to keep buying from them, um, but it's at least worth looking at. And that's kind of, it gets too hot, they're just trying to cover their costs to survive. And then tilapia is easier, but same thing here if it gets too cold. Uh, body temperature kind of shuts down. Uh, they're just hardly moving. Uh, we a lot, know a lot of times, those who like to fish, a lot of times it can be harder to catch fish when it's not the springtime and their metabolism's really starting to ramp up in water time and the, uh, the water temps are warming up. Same thing in kind of a, uh, this artificial situation. If it's too cold, metabolism slows down. They're not eating it nowhere near as much. And a lot of people just don't feed at all over the winter outside, uh, or it is very, very sparingly. If, they were, if these fish were homeotherms, then we would basically be feeding as much as possible, and they would be consuming a whole lot, of, pretty much about the same amount, 
for their entire lifespan, but that's not it. You, it's very easy to see you walk outside in January and feed, well, you can feed a, a cup full rather than a couple bags fulls. And then if it's in, within range, so uh, I don't know, maybe it's seven degrees or something for the tilapia. Yeah, they're still growing. Yes, they're still happy. They seem to be doing just fine. They seem to be growing fast enough. Um, and you may be perfectly fine with that. Unfortunately, if it's not more or less in your optimal, so optimal meaning they're consuming enough that they're packing on the actual weight uh, and not expending it either to, because it's too hot or too cold, whatever it may be, <clears throat> you get more into this optimal range than that fish may go from that nine or 10 months to that seven months. Uh, it may appear that they're feeding uh, very, very well, but maybe that's either that's all you've ever seen, that's your only system, and that's the best they've ever fed because water quality is better, because temperature uh, is a little bit different, whatever it may be. Just because it's in range and they appear to be eating very well doesn't necessarily mean that they are at their optimal. And it's certainly not temperature, it's just one of the factors. Go through quickly because I think I've got several slides left uh, and I don't want to run out of time and my watch is check here. What'd you, she say five tail? Five after. Whew, got scared for a second. Uh, of course, necessary for, for, to survive. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, uh, keep your fish happy. Keep plenty of oxygen pumping to them. Um, and this is kind of how not only their metabolism decreases as the temperature gets uh, uh, cooler or their metabolism is too high as it gets hotter, the amount of oxygen that a system can hold uh, substantially decreases as well. That's why people utilize things like paddle wheels or uh, or pure oxygen when they're shipping or whatever it may be. Um, so we'll go through this quickly just for, to, for sake of time. Uh, every fish kind of has its own optimal ranges. Um, stress, a lot of fish can acclimate uh, to a very wide range of, of pHs, uh, but it's really that harsh stress going immediately from one to the other. Uh, same thing with temperature, much harder to go from cooler to warmer than vice versa, but uh, those pH swings, you can get a lot of fish losses there, so just take your time with it. Uh, I, do make a, uh, I do make a slide here on ammonia just to try to give people an idea. This is pulled from an extension publication too. There's a lot of good ones out there, uh, and we can certainly uh, steer you towards them if you want to learn more. Uh, but of course, the dark bold, if you can't read, just says feed uh, being added to in this instance is the fish pond, um, and then what comes from the fish or what's uneaten certainly becomes that total ammonia nitrogen that we've talked about a lot, which is just the sum of the, the ionized or the non-toxic form and the toxic form. Very important for, for, uh, uh, for aquaponics, but very important for just a traditional pond. Those same bacteria are present in both situations, uh, allowing this uh, ammonia to break down. So you just break it down and it eventually nitrates, which is what we all uh, uh, hope to have in aquaponics and is perfectly fine in a, in a pond situation um, and then usually gets uptake by algae or, or, or plants or whatever it may be. Um, nitrates can be a problem in RAS, usually just when it gets really, really high um, and it's more of a, a chronic thing. You know, nitrates aren't an acute thing necessarily. It's going to happen. It's going to be something that as that system gets higher and higher and higher, um, you can have that build up and end up losing fish there. Um, quickly on treating your aquatic weeds, this is a great time to, to lose these fish and you want to limit the stress by using, if, if you are going to treat a pond for something, due to the correct time of year, nobody is going to recommend that you treat and kill all of your aquatic weeds, even if it looks like this, uh, or a lot worse, they're not going to recommend that you treat this entire pond with copper or anything like that in the heat of summer. The first thing it's going to do is kill everything it can possibly kill. So if it's an aquatic weed and it's susceptible to copper sulfate, it's going to die. Well, unfortunately, that decomposition process is using up oxygen, right? So now not only do you have whatever bacteria are present there or, or the bacteria that have died, um, you also have the fish that are using up oxygen and now you've just killed a whole bunch of plants that a lot of them during the day were providing you oxygen and now you're just dropping it. Uh, so limiting that stress at these types of, uh, of years, so properly identifying the species. Like I said, nothing too crazy uh, here. 
This is a terrible picture, but I couldn't find one good on the internet, so I took a picture of my book. Uh-oh. I'll do um, limit by stressing the fish, or uh, limit by stressing the fish. Limit stressing the fish through, um, you know, if you can, if your pond is small enough, um, any, anything to, to deter predation. Um, feeding during grow out, to give some folks an idea, this is shown a lot in all sorts of presentations, but it is a pretty good one. If you feed 2.2 pounds of feed to a system, kind of shows you your inputs, what's being used up versus what's being added to a system. Um, so you're producing carbon dioxide, you're producing waste solids, you're producing ammonia, but you're also using up this sort of stuff. And these are funky numbers, and I apologize, but pounds is easier for most people than kilograms. So 2.2 pounds of feed is one kilo. All of the figures look a lot prettier when you, or the numbers look a lot prettier when you do a kilo, but a lot of people don't know that 2.2 pounds is a kilo. So you kind of switch it over. Uh, if you want to see it in kilos, so you can kind of understand what's being produced. The ratios are the same. It's just whether or not it's pounds or kilos. But even if you're in an RAS, it gives you a good idea. If I'm humping five minutes, if I'm humping 40 pounds a day into this little system, well, what am I probably going to get? Well, about half of that's going to end up as something waste solids. So how are you going to remove that? Do you have the proper filtration to do so? Do you have the proper biofilters of the moving bed bioreactors to go through and, and uh, have enough bacteria there to convert that ammonia? Uh, it's the same thing with ponds too, though. It doesn't matter where you're adding that system. You add that pound, so that's part of it. If you do sample, whoops. If you do sample, uh, which I think, I think we learned today that uh, we've got some bluegill across the way for Barry Adler. He looked in the tank and said, yeah, they're this big. Uh, and then you get them out, and they're not quite as big as you thought they were. So a lot of times, uh, and I think Tom stresses this, just having those fish, uh, he's got them outside ready for whoever's going to come pick them up. But he's moving those fish out of his system, so that is his sample. He knows what size fish he's got coming out over here. Um, but understand, you know, sampling is quite important if you can do it, if it makes logistical sense, uh, but only do it kind of when it's right, as I say here. Uh, limit stress, you know, limit your handling, overfeeding, water quality problems, and, and surprises. Try to limit all of that while promoting everything. That's the trade-off, as I mentioned a second ago. When harvesting, of course, picture I just took over at Jones. Uh, depends on what you're doing, but for the most part, you need to be able to purge these fish somehow. Um, whether this is in a pond setting or, or RAS or, or whatever it may be. Uh, but if you don't purge these fish, they're going to wind up in a truck like this. They're going to be constantly producing and, and expelling waste from their system, which unfortunately it's a small amount of water for a lot of fish. Uh, you're going to degrade the water quality pretty quickly. Take the time to go through and purge them. Uh, and if they're ready for a, a food market, flavor tastes a lot better too. And usually that's used by cooling those fish down quite a good bit allows them to, uh, uh, and even salt it a little bit, allows them to expel all of those wastes. Have all of this stuff necessary and handy a day or two before. The last thing you need is to wake up in the morning early and say, all right, it's time to ha or harvest fish before it gets uh, too hot outside, uh, or maybe there's a storm coming through or whatever. But get everything ready a day or two in advance. You don't need to be scrambling for buckets or scrambling for vercon or bleach or um, whatever it may be, have it all handy for you because once those fish are out, they're out. You know, they're, they're stressed out. You need to get them where they're going as quickly as possible. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're going to a cooler uh, or, or wherever they're going. Um, understand kind of uh, all of that is very stressful for the animal and especially if they're going for a pond stocking. They don't need those fish to be put on a truck, hauled somewhere, and then they immediately die. Well, their customers are ticked off. They're ticked off at you and everything else. Um, same thing, there's a considerable amount of folks who do uh, largemouth bass live hauling, whether it be up north or wherever it may be, same thing. You take your time uh, and don't hurriedly, but conscientiously moving those fish uh, into a live haul tank. They haven't been properly purged or whatever. What you're going to find is that they're going to get up to the Asian market and be in an aquarium, and then they're going to break out and have a big old fuzz all over them, a big fungus on them. No one's going to buy that fish. The supplier's then going to come back and complain at you. It doesn't matter if it's pond stocking or whatever it may be. Uh, when it's time to harvest, have everything ready. And have enough people on hand. 
lot of people want to limit the amount of labor, which is 100% understandable, but if you're breaking your back uh, trying to do everything yourself uh, and you're dropping fish and they're falling on their heads and they get scrapes on them, especially if they're going for a live haul, well now that fish has been scraped, it might get uh, a secondary pathogen into their body which makes everybody else sick. You can end up losing thousands of dollars of fish for not paying a FFA student to come help you out for a couple hours. Um, regulations, the only reason I, I pulled this up uh, was strictly because um, Jones gave the talk at OAA uh, this past year. It was, I don't know, something of a commercial hatchery. I forget what his title was, but shortcuts are not worth it. Uh, do your due diligence and, and, and really take the time to, to figure out what's going on. In transporting, nothing crazy. Uh, I already kind of mentioned this. Everything's geared towards limiting stress. Final thoughts, we're all here to help, um, including your state associations. Um, there are some folks from Indiana here. Indiana has the Indiana Aquaculture Association. I'll be in Iowa next week. There's a huge Iowa Aquaculture Conference there. Um, you've got the Michigan Aquaculture Association. There's folks all over in the Midwest willing to help you out as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> whether you've been in the business for a few days, there's always room for improvement. Um, and then there are really good webinars. I know a lot of people don't want to sit down and watch an hour-long webinar. Some people, they say our attention spans less than three minutes. Um, but if you're serious about the business, uh, some of these are very, very good. Uh, Dr. Roy uh, uh, Yanong with the University of Florida, he gives a couple presentations on biosecurity, specifically in aquaculture. Uh, Dr. Jesse Chushinsky is with USDA. Um, actually, no, she's with Idaho Fish and Game. She talks about antibiotic resistance in aquaculture. Um, but this webinar series, I think I pulled it up. Oh, I pulled it up on my computer, not this computer. I'm sorry. Um, I was going to take you to it, but if you just go to nickrac.org, uh, they have at least 16 of these webinars, so it's a huge series. On, and it's not just fish health. There's um, FSIS related to catfish uh, folks, the Food Safety Inspection Service. There's, uh, I think, some water quality talks. There's all sorts of things. And you can just type in the search bar in the top corner. I said, when you go over to Mark's, maybe I can <coughs> pull it up for you. Uh, but it's uh, a, a huge, I mean, a, a really, really good thing. And they're all put on by, I think, they're not all university folks. Jessie is no longer university, even though she was with uh, University of Illinois at Carbondale, I believe. Uh, but most of them are put on by our aquaculture professionals throughout the country. And they do a really good job. Uh, so if you have questions on that, I'd be glad to help. Uh, we're gonna, the next one we're going to do, Alan Patillo, if you've met him, he actually moved to Jamaica to work with an aquaponics operation. Uh, so I'm taking over the webinar series, and I think the next one's going to be on co-ops. Uh, so we'll kind of see something else uh, and we do have that co-op just while I'm thinking I'll go ahead and offer the plug we do have the co-op meeting <laughs> coming up next month I think it's the 16th so if you haven't signed up I'm sure Alicia will have a sign up or something but that's going to be uh, I think it's oh yeah it is I'm pretty sure it's going to be free because Ohio Soybean Council is uh, giving us launch and all sorts of things too they've been a huge Promoter, and for those of you who don't know, there's a ton of soy being used in aquaculture, as was mentioned. It just needs to be high quality, right? And not the holes. It needs to be, it needs to be the good part. That's all I got. Like I said, I'm not a aquatic health specialist or anything like that. I don't have a background in fish health. It was just more or less common sense stuff that a lot of boot camp folks and hopefully some people who've been in the business kind of see. Okay, so my name is Mark. One of the things we're going to do today is I really want to talk to you about the elements of aquatic animal health which in some ways is probably going to be a little bit backwards from the way you've done this morning so you've already heard from Matt and you've already done your fish dissection um, but hopefully what I'm going to do is what I'm talking about is just general upper level sort of stuff I'm not going to get into specific diseases and things like that I just want to talk about basic practices <laughs> with the idea that it'll hopefully just tie stuff together so, you know, stuff that you saw this morning that uh, um, Stephen went through, you know, is suddenly going to sort of click and make sense as to what you're seeing. So, so yeah. So, really, the function of today is to know what fish health is. And 
really the idea is, is that you're able to go out to your pond or go and look at your tanks and know that you've got a sick fish and then from my perspective know the steps to go through to start to get that fish diagnosed and treated. So, um, and really you know, we're doing that so that we can link the importance of fish health with your production success because we're not just doing this for healthy fish, we're doing this so that you can also optimise the amount of money that you make and minimise the amount of effort that you have to go through and minimise the amount of losses that you have to endure. So, so really what I want to do is I want to talk about how you can actually tell if your fish is sick, so what the clinical signs are and sort of upper level what possible causes are. And the way we'll do that is I don't specifically want to just talk about a, um, aquaculture per se. So my background is actually I'm an aquatic animal health vet. So I spent my earlier career, well I started my career working in emergency medicine with cats and dogs. Then I spent a fair bit of my career playing with things like sea turtles and dugongs and manatees and dolphins and you know, jumping on the occasional whale and things like that. So I'm not a fish vet per se, I'm actually an aquatic animal health vet. My aquaculture background comes in that I've worked with the crocodile industry and the alligator industry in Australia and Florida respectively. So that's sort of how I fit in with this. So what I'm doing is I kind of want to talk about the general principles of aquaculture and aquatic health and not necessarily specifically diseases of perch sort of thing. So, so I'm going to end up giving examples which are from aquaria and wildlife and various things like that, not just pond medicine. So I'm from OSU, so being from an academic institute, it's important that we always start everything off with a formal definition. Okay, so Aquatic animals are, there's actually a reason I'm doing this, aquatic animals are any, any life stage of gametes, eggs, fry or adult, of fish, mollusks, crustaceans or amphibians, taken from the wild or produced in captivity for farming, release, human consumption or ornamental display. And really that's, a, um, that's the aquatic animal health code, that's the definition of aquatic animals in the code. I find it a bit interesting that they don't consider reptiles, considering the industries we've got with crocodilians and all that sort of stuff, but they, um, they don't. The reason why I've got that big, long, convoluted definition up there is I kind of want to get the point across that we're talking holistically, we're talking total things. So whether you guys are producing eggs to go into a market, whether you're producing fry to sell on, or whether you're taking the animal the whole way through for production to adults, it all sort of comes under this category of you know, health initiatives and looking at health. And therefore, as far as what we're talking about with aquatic animal health, is the condition of a treatment of all of those above talked about aquatic animals to control, and probably the most important word that we're going to use throughout this entire talk, is prevent diseases. Because obviously if we can prevent something, it's a lot easier than trying to deal with it once it's in there. So when I give lectures to vet students, whether it's at OSU or whether it was down at UF or whether it was back in Australia, one of the things we sort of always got across to them when dealing with fish or dealing with any sort of aquatic animal is it's really just wet herd health. Because more often than not, particularly with veterinarians, when it comes to dealing with fish, you know, I can remember back most general practice vets, if you took a fish into general practice, they'd freak out. You know, they didn't know what to do with it. So really, the point that we're trying to get across is, is that even if you've got a background in aquaculture of 30 plus years or whether you've never actually touched a fish before, whether you're a Stephen Reichley fish expert veterinarian or whether you're a veterinarian that's dealt with cats and dogs your entire life, really you probably understand stuff about other species which you can apply to fish quite successfully as far as the basic principles go. Okay, so. Wet herd health, you probably know a whole bunch of stuff from cattle or pigs or horses or sheep or something which if you just apply those principles to fish, you're well on your way of being able to work out what's going on and working out how to actually care for them. So, all right. From our point of view, from a production point of view, why we're dealing with this at the herd level or the pond level versus the individual level is it's economy of scale. You know, yes, in general practice you can have People bring in their pet goldfish and they want you to treat it for ick or something like that, that's fine. Um, but in reality, you're not dealing with the individual fish. You may be using individual fish in your pond as signs of what's going on with the health of your pond, but you're talking about the pond as it is per se. Okay, because you know, basically 
it's where your money's coming from at the herd level. What I want to kind of get across though is it's not like it used to be or it's not this perception that if your fish get sick, you're in trouble. Okay? It's not that you're going to lose your entire pond. Okay? The way things are going now with aquaculture, with successful treatments, um, with prevention, you're well on top of it. You can usually be really successful in dealing with pretty much any issue that you come across. Okay. But as we've already said, the best form of treating any sort of sick animal or any sort of sick fish is prevention. So why does aquatic animal health sort of really matter in this sense? Well, I guess 30 odd years ago a lot of aquaculture was done as a subsistence level. So it was a local industry, it produced things locally, sent it out locally. Now that's no longer the case. Now we deal globally and you know, I guess the best example we can always give is tilapia for example. You, know, you can get tilapia produced much cheaper and imported into the States you know, that comes out of um, Asia than what you can actually produce it here. So it's a global market that we're actually dealing with. Wild caught um, species have gone down dramatically, therefore aquaculture produced species have gone up dramatically. So in order to compete with that in Ohio, and I think Ohio is in a really good position to be able to deal with aquaculture. You've got an industry which has got a huge amount of potential and in a lot of ways you're sort of still working out what species you can do and what niche markets you can aim for. So you're sort of in a good position um, to be able to take advantage of this high demand for aquaculture and be able to streamline it to become efficient and be able to make it so that you're actually competitive on the global market all right, and produce something which is a high quality product. All right? And that's really I think why Matt sort of organised today so that we can sort of come in and talk about health and those basic sort of things and how we can help streamline your industry. So, all right, I guess just to give an example of this, this is a Florida alligator or it's American alligator from Florida. Um, the industry there was largely unaided by veterinarians for a very long time. So when I moved to Florida back in 2010, one of the things we set out to do was actually get involved with alligator research because I came from a background of dealing with crocodiles in Australia. So. Um, what we found was is that the industry had been doing really well by itself but there were issues that they were coming up against which they sort of needed some help with and this is where we were able to come in and help them streamline and one of the examples of that is umbilical scarring. So that's a yearling, so that's about a 14, 16 month old alligator there. They grow alligators for three years. So you go out, you harvest your eggs, you hatch them you then grow them for three years and then you send them off to a market unless you've got an issue and then you try and sell them for what they call watch strap which is usually when they're about the age of this alligator. So when they're about a year you can get a watch strap out of them. If you can grow them out to three years you can get a handbag out of them. So that's sort of the standards that you're aiming for. The most important part of an alligator is this bit just in here. So if we've got a big scar sitting here caused by the umbilicus doesn't take too much imagination to know that your product goes from being worth $1,000, being sent, sold as a three-year-old animal, down to being absolutely worthless and rejected. So anything over three-eighths of a scar width ends up being a rejected product. Okay. So, um, so one of the things we did was we came in and we helped them look at ways to improve their incubation and we worked out that if you just left them in the nest after they hatched, so you didn't try and remove the eggs, you didn't try and remove you know, that stuff which comes out with the yolk sac. You gave them nesting bedding that they could actually literally just sit in. You didn't try and feed them any time within the first week or so. We found that those scars all closed down because what it was doing was it was minimising their amount of movement and it was enabling to use this yolk sac which they already have as their food until it closed down and healed. Okay, which when you think about it isn't really rocket science is it because that's exactly what happens out in the wild. You basically leave an alligator nest and the alligators emerge when they're about a week or so old. So by doing that we managed to take what was a two million dollar industry at the time which was then costing them supposedly six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year due to umbilical scarring up to a ten million dollar industry which it is now and we've actually got some control mechanisms in place to reduce this scarring. So, All right so with aquatic animal health, we really talk about two main types of fish diseases. That's infectious diseases, so that's things like your parasites, your bacteria, your viruses and your fungus. And then your non-infectious diseases, 
So that's your environmental diseases, um, nutritional problems, and then your basic genetics. So how do you know if your fish is sick? This is the interactive part of this talk. <laughs> what signs do you look for? How can you tell if you go out to your pond in the morning that you've got sick fish? Yep. <laughs> yep. Floating alive, floating dead. Mm -hmm. Yep. Movement, they're up against the bank. Yep. You, you don't normally see your fish. If you see fish, you have a problem normally. Yep. So lethargic or uh, I am visible. Stop eating. Stop eating. Okay. With eating, if you go out to you feed them of a morning. So you go out, you feed them of a morning. They don't eat. What do you do then? Okay, check water quality, awesome. Do you panic as soon as they haven't fed that time? Do you leave it a couple of days? Do you leave it a week? Two days? Sound about reasonable? Anyone do it in less time? Less than one day. Less than one day? Okay, good. Are there other facts, just going on with the feeding, are there other factors which can affect feeding? Temperature, lights, <coughs> predators, oxygen levels, yeah. So, yeah, so you're probably right. You don't go out and have a look and if they don't feed, then you suddenly say net them all up and rush them into the vet. But if they haven't fed by the end of that day, the next day, then, a, um, yeah, you've got a problem going on and you investigate it more. Okay, what else? What other sorts of signs? Yep, flashing. What's flashing? Um, like when they're like really fast, like all of a sudden they're on the spurts so fast. Yep. Like yep, so they dart around. Any other of those sorts of behavioural things? Jumping. Jumping. Piping, gaping at the surface, those sorts of things. Yep, awesome. Okay, so what I've done is I've just listed a few things up there. The most common sign, unfortunately, that you see when your fish are sick is you've got dead fish. And that's usually the first thing because it happens quickly. Well, to us it happens quickly. Excess mucus, you know, they're bloated or they're floating. They, um, they've got dropsy, so they get oedema, they get water coming in them and it bloats them out. Um, they've got one thing we didn't mention is they've got some sort of, you know, lesion. So some, usually erythema, which is, you know, reddening of the skin or some sort of sore looking like skin on them. Gas bubbles or they're fluffy and wormy. Behaviourally, we kind of went through that and we'll talk about it in a minute as well, but realistically, as far as clinical signs go, that's not a huge amount of stuff to go on, is it? So like when I used to do emergency medicine, if somebody came in with their dog and their dog was bloated and lethargic and they wanted me to come up with a diagnosis, it would be pretty much impossible for me to do it without further diagnostics or without taking one hell of a you know, successful guess of what's going on. All right. So, but fish, you're kind of limited. They don't have that many clinical signs, and you know, you guys have to deal with the fact that chances are you're going to get a floating dead fish sitting on the top of your pond, and you've got to work out what's going on. So, one of the things I want to do during this talk is just sort of talk about some of the initial diagnostics that you can do on farm, which can just sort of help you if you're willing to get into doing them, sort of help you tailor where you're going if you get any problems and identify what's going on. So, we're going to talk about. You know, distance exams, which is behavioural stuff, water quality, skin fin and gills, response to therapy, the actual environment, and then some of the husbandry stuff that we can do. So I think we pretty much covered all of these. Lethargic, dead, floating, piping, spinning, dar darting. So, you know, as we said, if this was in cats and dogs, there's so little to actually go on, but this is what you guys have to deal with. So, All right, so what's the three most important things when dealing with I am aquatic animal health. Water, water, water. You know, nine times out of ten, if you've got a health issue of some sort going on with your animals, it's going to come back to your water quality one way or another. So probably the best thing I could recommend you do is go out and get a decent water quality kit. So you know, not the $10 one from Walmart sort of thing, but go out and get like a heart kit, which costs a few hundred dollars. Learn how to use it and learn what normal parameters are for your pond that you're dealing with. So I've intentionally stuck reef aquarium water parameters up here because they're not going to apply to anybody in this room. And the reason why I've done that is 
is that you don't want to turn around and say, well, Flint turned around and said pH should be between 8.2 and 8.4, because that's not going to be the case for your freshwater ponds up here in Ohio sort of thing. What's going to be normal for you is going to vary depending on what species of fish that you've got and what your ponds are and what's successful for you. So we can help you come up with those parameters and Matt Smith is probably a really good person to be able to talk to for getting what's normal and you know, what's expected in your ponds. But get a test kit, learn how to use it, learn what's normal and then you'll be able to know how to tell when something's abnormal. And not just that, if you've got something that's abnormal, we can then help you talk through as to why it's abnormal. So, you know, it doesn't mean a thing if, okay, my normal DO level is 10, but my DO level this morning is 6. Well, that means nothing unless you actually know that that means our oxygen level's dropped. We need to add more, you know, air pumps in there or whatever and re-oxygenate. If you're willing, this is probably a really good tool that you can learn, and this is skin fin and gilling your fish. All right, what you need to do it is you're going to need a microscope, some slides, some microscope slides, a pair of forceps or fine tweezers, and a small pair of scissors. And what you do is you can get a fish out, get the microscope slide, scrape it along its body, and that does a skin a, um, count for it. Put it under the slide and you can have a look. You can take your forceps and your pair of scissors and you take the tiniest bit, like I'm talking like, you know, one twentieth of an inch sort of thing size of tissue off the fin. Stick that on the slide, have a look. Same thing for the gills. So you open up that operculum, you take the tiniest, tiniest bit of gill out, so you're actually just grabbing a couple of lamellae, put them on the slide and have a look. What you're doing by that is you're actually doing your first veterinary diagnostics on them and you're really looking to see if you've got any sort of oxygen problems. So if you've got gills which are really bright red, that means they're probably not getting very good oxygen to them. Or more importantly, more commonly, you're looking for parasites. So each of these little black circles is a parasite egg sitting on, this is a gill lamella. And so just by learning to look under there, you can... That's just a mic. There's no preparation done to that. That's literally clipping it, sticking it on a slide, sticking a cover slip over, sticking it under the microscope, and looking at that would be like times 20 probably. Okay. So it's not like you have to have special stains for it. It's not like it needs to get sent in. This is something that takes you, when you know how to do it, oh, yeah. it takes like a minute to do and look awesome. But yeah. And it is, it's, an, it's a great first diagnostics. It's the absolute first thing we do whenever we see a sick fish. And if it's something you can do at home or at your pond, then it'll help you identify what direction you're heading in as far as your sick animal goes. Now the other thing which I'm not such a fan of, but we'll talk about it anyway for completeness, is you know, response to therapy. And that's basically, you know, I put some medication in there and it got better. All right. To be perfectly honest, it's what we used to do a lot in general practice. You know, someone comes in with a dog with red skin. I don't know what bacteria is causing that red skin. What I do know though is if I give it cephalexin, which is an antibiotic, and I give it a steroid to make it less itchy, there's a better than average chance it's going to get better. I'm never going to know what the causative agent was, but I've treated that animal and I've sent it off. That's good. You can do that with your fish, and a lot of people do that. You know, more often than not, what ends up happening is it's like, well, this is kind of similar to what happened last time, and I've got a couple of bags of Romet out the back, so I'm just going to feed them that for a few days and see what happens. It may work, it may not work. The downsides to it is if it doesn't work, is you've you had to pay for that Romet. It may be free because it's sitting out your back, but you've had to buy it at some stage, so it's cost you money to treat them. If it's not the right thing, you've given them an antibiotic which they didn't need, therefore when in six months time you actually might need that Romat, you can't use it because there could be a potential antibiotic resistance going on. Or you uh, um, could be creating a saleability problem. So you could be feeding your fish a drug which then means you can't sell them for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days or forever depending on the limitations of the drug. So whilst it is something which gets done and I know it's commonly done in Florida, I can talk about it's absolutely the first thing that gets done. You know, before at the diagnostic lab, before we used to get any fish in, I, um, you'd, always, you'd always say, what have you already done? And you can guarantee they've already spent a week or so treating it one way or another before they brought it to us. But, you know, there are definitely risks associated with it. Okay, so 
one of the other things that you can do as far as your diagnosing is look at your actual environment. And so that's your filtration systems and your actual water. So, you know, one of the things we used to do, and this isn't more of an aquarium thing, but can certainly be done for ponds, is we used to put screens onto our filters because we knew fully well that if we didn't find a parasite or something on a particular species of fish but we thought it was in that system, if we stuck screens on the filters, one thing we know is, is that every bit of water inside that tank is going to get drawn through that filter at least several times during the day. So if we have screens on them, every bit of water which could potentially be carrying parasite eggs or you know, whatever the cause of evasion is in it will end up touching on that screen. So we'd put the screens on the filters, then we'd take them off after a day or so scrape them, have a look under the microscope exactly the same way we do with the skin fin and gills and we could have a look at what sort of critters were actually sitting in the water. And that's sort of something that you can sort of consider doing as well. After you've done that, hopefully you've got an idea of what's actually going on with your animals, but if not, you can at least bring them in here. And that's something I want to make sure everyone's aware actually exists. So there is a resource available here at ODA in that building over there that you can bring your sick fish into and you can have them necropsied and they will diagnose them for you and they will um, tell you what the parasite is or whatever the disease process is and how to treat it. So that's part of an um, Department of Ag service which is provided. We used to do the same thing down in Florida and that was the lab that we used to actually use and Dr Hartman will talk to you this afternoon. She was actually, she is part of this lab so she's in the same building that we're in and what we'd always say is we'd suggest that you bring in not dead animals but four sick animals within the tank or the pond or whatever you're dealing with. We will then euthanise them, we'll do a gross examination on them. Once we've done that gross exam we can call you and we can tell you what's what we at least found grossly and it may be parasites so we may be able to sort of say this is how you should start treating. If not we would then move on to doing things like I'm um, doing micro, so we'd take sterile swabs of the spleen, the liver, the kidneys, and then we'd culture them for specific bacteria. Um, we'd then store samples that if we wanted to screen for a um, particular virus as we could later, sort of thing. Now, one of the other things that we used to do, which is another thing if you guys are getting microscopes and doing skin fin and gills, is another thing you can start to do is squish preps. And what that is, it's where you take so you open up the animal and you've all been shown now how to do a fish dissection. So you can find the liver. You can take a tiny little bit of liver, for example, or a bit of gut, stick it onto a slide, squish it under another slide, and then without any preparation, no staining, no anything, you can look at it under the microscope. And if it's got parasites, they're really obvious to see. You can start to learn for changes, things like the liver, for example, ends up getting all these brown dots on it if the fish is getting sick. So, you know, just little things that can actually give you a hint as to what's going on with your diagnostics. So, something else that can be done. But probably one of the important things to deal with, and you'll end up talking about it this afternoon with Dr. Hartman, is husbandry. You know, and that's not really just water quality. Husbandry is actually management of the people and of your production. And this is being a little bit sort of facetious, but talking about ways to maximise pathogens so, and that's to increase your high stocking densities, a, um, have excessive biofilms, have dead animals, all of these things which actually go towards contributing to high organic loads. So organic loads are really great fodder for growing bacteria or withholding nasty things in them. So anything you sort of do which is going to maximise organic loads is going to maximise the number of pathogens that you've got. But it's not just what's going on within your tank. So one of the things is that you know, if you've got ponds of water nearby or one of the problems that you deal with up here in Ohio is you've got lots and lots of bodies of water. You've got animals which fly all over the place like your Canadian geese and they can transmit diseases. So it's not just dealing with what's going on inside of your tank, it's what's around you as well that you've got to learn to control. And you know, even if you're not dealing with ponds, it's still things like the food that you're using, you know, water lying um, on the floor, ceilings and walls which all get wet and have condensation on them, anything which has got moisture on it which can actually sort of hold a, um, pathogens in it. So one of the ways to actually minimise your pathogens is to not just sort of deal with the fish specifically in the tank but also deal with the non-living things which are in and around your tank and so that's you know like sweep up the floors and you know make sure that they don't have water on them and 
make sure that your walls uh, aren't always damp and you know, keep your feed so they're nice and dry. All right, and then other living things as well, which we talked about, like Canadian geese and that. And you know, this is one thing. So I used to work at a rather large public aquaria, and it always amazed me that the big tank which we had, which was a few hundred thousand gallons, which used to keep our sand tiger sharks in it and our sea turtles and that, you can see the top of that tank up there. You can see sunlight through there. That was all open top. Around the top, we used to have our quarantine tanks. And so we'd actually be bringing in animals and quarantining them for 30 days. And it was probably like six or so foot away from our biggest tank that we actually had in the aquarium, which was the one everyone came to see. And that's the one when people got married that stand in front of it and have the sharks swimming around in the background sort of thing. We used to have this huge risk of puddles of water and tanks literally feet away from one of our biggest exhibits. So. All right, so as far as management goes of husbandry, probably one of the most important things you can do, and Dr. Hartman will talk to you about it this afternoon, is developing a biosecurity plan. Okay, and that's things like your um, quarantine plans, and really what that comes down to is it's your risk analysis. And what you're trying to do is you look at each potential risk, whether that's the risk of feeding out, the risk of people using you know, going from one tank to another without washing their hands, the risk of people you know, taking nets out without cleaning them. And then you're assigning how risky is that. You know, all my feed comes in and it's, you know, it's all bagged up and it's all commercial feed, so that's a low risk. I've never ever washed my hands going between one tank or another, so that's potentially a high risk. You know, we've never cleaned our nets, so that's potentially a high risk. So actually identifying what those risks are and then coming up with a way to minimise a um, transmission of diseases or problems. So, you know, whether that's things like, well, I'm going to start washing my hands between tanks, or we're going to have individual nets for each individual pond, you know, or we're going to continue to get the feed that we've got and we're not going to go and outsource it to wild caught food or something. So, that's sort of your plan. But the, probably the most important part of that plan is, is that communicating it. It's one thing for you to turn around as, you know, the owner of the farm to go, this is what we're going to do. It's another thing to know that every single person that comes on that farm buys into it and does it. You know, there's no point you washing your hands between each tank if the person who feeds your fish never washes their hands. So, so really what this comes down to is, is developing plans for prevention. And your biosecurity goals should be coming up with a healthy stock of animals, being able to control any potential pathogens, and then having everybody who works there being able to understand how to control things and how to minimise your risks. <coughs> and I guess one of the other things to consider is where you're actually getting your animals from and what sort of risks you're introducing. And you know, again, this is sort of talking generally, but there are problems with each source. Whether you've got wild caught animals and you know, with alligators in Florida, every single egg that we get is harvested from the wild, whereas in Australia with crocodiles, only 50% of the eggs were harvested. So there were all those inherent risks of knowing locations of where you're bringing animals in from. When I used to work at the aquarium, we managed to introduce a, um, amyloidinia into our stock and wipe out literally thousands of fish because it seemed cheaper at the time to go out and actually catch the fish from the local bay because it was just bait fish we were after than actually buy them in from somebody who, was, who could source them properly. Ended up costing us thousands and thousands of dollars. So there's always risks. Uh, donations with hobbyists or from anybody who's not really certified sort of thing. And then knowing your actual breeders. So knowing where you're sourcing your animals from, whether they've had previous problems, and what their actual health status is as far as registration goes. Another way of preventing disease outbreaks is the immune status of your animals. And really the easiest way to do that is buy in animals which you know are healthy and try and keep your animals healthy. And the easiest way to keep animals healthy is to decrease their stress. So stress causes immunosuppression, same as it does in every single species. And immunosuppression is caused by things like handling stress or water quality, nutritional stress, all those sorts of things. So if you keep stuff as healthy as possible, the chances of it breaking out with a disease are minimised. Have a quarantine plan that's actually in place for anything which comes in. It's usually like about a 30-day clearance, but that depends on what your farm's operating as. Use an all-in, all-out approach. So it's the same as other species of animals or you know, pigs and things like that. You don't sort of get in a thousand fish, 
turn around and say, well, 500 are looking well, so we'll stick them into the pond, but 500 of them are still looking pretty poor, so we'll keep them sort of aside for another week. It doesn't work that way. It's all of them in and all of them out. And then any sort of populations that you come in, you keep a close eye on, so you do your skin fin and gills, you watch your behaviours, you, you know, take note of anything that actually dies, working out why it's died, and keep them isolated from the rest of your farm until you're confident that they're actually healthy enough to go in with them. And that's it. That's all I really wanted to talk about. Okay, so Matt asked me to, to, to talk to you guys about, I don't like standing behind the podium, but uh, to talk about antibiotics and, and VFDs, right? So there's some new regulations out that, that came into effect this year, um, earlier this year, talking, addressing about the, the antibiotic usage, right? And so the big thing now is, is antibiotic resistance and making sure that the, the pathogens that we deal with when, when humans get sick, they've been finding resistance of those bacterial pathogens to, to antibiotics. So they're really taking a look. Uh, so they, the push now is to try and make sure that we're using antibiotics in a judicious manner, right? That we're making sure that fish are sick or animals are sick before we're using it. We're not using them for growth promoting purposes and, and those kind of things. And so that's really the impetus behind these new VFD regulations and, and, and really what, what's going to impact um, what impacts you guys as producers. And we had that conversation in the back over lunch about, you know, part of this is, is, is going to talk about the regulatory side of things and I'm by no means an, an expert, so this is just a, from my perspective and, and what I have to deal with. Um, but this isn't even going to touch on the availability of getting medicated feed. You know, I know that's a huge issue here in the Midwest for a lot of producers of how we even purchase it and in the quantities that we need. And so uh, unfortunately that's a hurdle that we're going to have to continue to work on and, and try and improve. So looking at the antibiotics that are actually approved for use in, in aquaculture, uh, we have fluorophenicol or aquaflor, oxytetracycline, uh, teramycin, and the sulfa drug uh, with, with Romet. Um, so those are the three approved drugs for use in, in, in aquaculture. So it makes, I always joke with the, with the veterinarians when I talk with them because it makes my life uh, pretty easy that I don't have to try and remember all the different, different drugs. Um, and I don't know, Matt, there's a, there's a way we can get these present, the presentation to them? Yeah, the voiceover PowerPoint will be uploaded online. Okay, yeah, so I know a lot of people are writing a bunch of stuff down and I'm, I'm happy to upload the PDFs too, that way you guys have them. So I didn't want you to feel like you had to make sure you caught everything as, as we went here. So. Um, so fluorophenicol, like I said, it's the brand name there is Aquaflor. It's available from, from Merck Animal Health. Uh, and, and I have just some, some characteristics of each of these medicated feeds. And, and I think it's important to keep, keep in mind how they work and from a, from a producer standpoint. So when I showed up at, at, at Clear Springs and we were kind of talking about this, is it's important to understand the underlying principle of how it works. So that way you make sure you're applying it in the correct manner, right? So, so this is what's called a bacteriostatic uh, antibiotic, right? So it, actually, it doesn't actually kill the bacteria, it just stops the growth, right? So over time, if it's stopping the growth of the bacteria that's already there, it's going to, to decrease the amount of bacteria that's in, in the fish. The important thing, especially for you guys, is it's a time-dependent antibiotic, okay? So what that means is it's important that the antibiotic remains in the bloodstream for a long period of time. That's where it's going to be most efficacious, right? So before, uh, we used to feed fluorophenicol, and I, we'd feed aquaflor at the, in the raceways. You know, we'd throw all the medicated feed in at first, first feeding of the day. Give them their ration of aquaflor in the morning, and that was it. That way we made sure, right, the thought process is making sure the fish ate it all, and that that fluorophenicol got in those fish. But the problem is, because it's time dependent, over the course of the day, that, that, that antibiotic, that level of drug in the bloodstream decreases and so therefore there's a lot of hours over the course of that evening, night and into the next morning that the, the level of the drug isn't there at high enough concentrations to do anything. So, so what we've done now is we've switched and aquaflor is fed in first feeding and also last feeding of the day. Right? And so that way again you're, you're dosing. Just like when you go to the, the doctor and they say take this antibiotic every 12 hours right, or twice a day. It's the same principle, right? So that's important to know and that's, that's going to be the case you'll see with all of these, the drugs that we use in aquaculture. They're all time dependent, so it's important from when you're actually delivering that feed to the farm to, to understand that. 
And again, we have, I put dosing on here, but again, just the label claim. Of course, as you're working uh, with your veterinarian to get a VFD to actually use these drugs, uh, they'll have all those instructions for you. The other important thing is withdrawal time, right? So after you feed the, the medicated feed, you, you cannot harvest those fish for 15 days, right? So there's withdrawal time for every drug. That's something you have to take into account. You know, when we have fish that are getting close to market size and before we harvest those, I work with the, per, with the farm and the manager to, to say, okay, are you, are you planning on sending these to the processing plant uh, anytime soon? Or, you know, what's the timeline on that? And that's where we make the determination whether or not we're going to put, that's part of the way we make the determination whether or not we're going to put that, that pond on, on antibiotics. So you have to take into account the 10 days that you're feeding it and also the 15 days that they're in withdrawal. So fluorophenicol, you'll see, again, all these, these antibiotics, they, are, they have label claims, meaning that uh, you can use them for these different, and these groups of, of fish for these particular uh, pathogens, right? So this is just off of what the label claim is for, for aquaflora. You can see uh, the list of, of bacterial agents that you can, you can use the, that, bacteria, or that, that antibiotic for. And again, so this is based off of a, a diagnosis that you're going to work with your veterinarian to, to reach. And, and you know, I think it's important too, I want to point out that uh, the veterinarian can actually write a VFD for that, that disease without actually having to, to wait for the cultures to grow. Right? So I don't have to wait for, like particularly for this Flavobacterium columnare or, or even Cycrophyllum. Cycrophyllum, in my hand, Cycrophyllum takes 48 hours. So when fish come into my diagnostic lab and I cut those fish open and, and we streak those onto bacterial plates, I don't necessarily know it's Cycrophyllum until 48 hours later. Well, in the meantime, we were losing fish, right? And, and the fish aren't wanting to eat because they're sick. So we need to get that antibiotic in, into that population as soon as possible. So we can make a, a diagnosis based off of the clinical picture, and that's, that's, uh, that's something that, that veterinarians, we can do. We can look at that, take into account the history, take into account the necropsy like you guys did today, all of those clinical pictures, and, and write, a, write a VFD based on that. So teramycin, this is another uh, antibiotic that we, that we have uh, at our disposal. So at Clear Springs, we use uh, aquaflor and, and teramycin. Those are the two antibiotics that I, that I prescribe on, on uh, a fairly regular basis, right? you know, obviously as needed. But um, you know, I've got any given day, I've got 9 million fish swimming uh, across our, our seven grow out farms. So I have a lot of fish to, to take care of there. But, uh, TM, it's again another bacteriostatic and again time dependent. So good for you guys to know if you guys have fish that you're putting on antibiotic, again making sure that you're, you're splitting that into two different feedings. Okay, and, and it's really a good idea and, and like the, the, the protocol that we have at Clear Springs for every pond that gets put on antibiotic, I have that as the sole ration for the first four to five days. And that's to make sure that those fish are getting that antibiotic and that it's getting into the system. Of course, I always have to balance production, right? I got the managers always telling me, well, I got production goals to hit and I have to get these pounds out the door. So we can um, use non-medicated feed in addition to the medicated feed, but you have to use it appropriately and you have to be smart about it and making sure that the most important part is that they're getting that medicated feed in there, okay? So again, dosing on there, that's a little bit different. It's a, it's a grams of, of oxytet per 100 pound of fish. Again, you've got 10 days of, of feeding and then another 15 days uh, of withdrawal time. And, and again, I put a note there, it's different for use in lobsters. I don't know anyone who's, anyone raising lobsters in here? No, okay. So TM, again, there's, there's, some, there's some restrictions on the use in catfish. As far as, as far as temperature wise, but again, label claim for most of those bacteria that, that we deal with. Uh, and again, the, this needs to be a diagnosis made by the veterinarian and working with you in, in, the, in the, the valid uh, patient-client relationship, which we'll get to uh, going forward. So uh, the last antibiotic we have is Romet. Um, again, bactericidal, time dependent. This can be incorporated into the floating feed or, or applied as top coat. So this is actually mi mixed uh, on the farm you have the, the dosing there and, and that withdrawal depending upon the species that you're raising. So again, you just gotta make sure you work with the veterinarian to make sure that you're feeding. It's really important you feed the antibiotic in the way it's prescribed for the full duration, right? Just like you guys hear from your doctor, if you've got a sinus infection, they give you a Z pack. You don't take two days of Z pack and then you're done, right? You need to follow that whole, the whole uh, course of antibiotic through to try and 
uh, make sure that that antibiotic is, is going to always remain effective against the, the pathogens. So Romet, these are label claims uh, for Romet. And again, that, this will all be online, so you don't have to, to uh, write all that down. So the other thing I wanted to touch base on before we got into the VFDs was ADAP. Uh, and we had that conversation with some, some folks, again, in the back at lunch uh, about the Aquatic Animal Drug Approval Partnership. This was established uh, in 94, again, when, when FDA said, okay, aquaculture drugs are going to be regulated. And the whole point of this partnership is to allow for progress to continue to be made to allow more drugs to be approved in aquaculture. Right? So it costs a lot of money for a drug company to go through all the processes and steps to say the drug is efficacious, it works against the pathogen that we have a label claim for, and it's safe. Right? So there's a lot, of, a lot of hoops they have to jump through. And so this partnership is designed to try and lower those, those hurdles. That way we can more quickly get, get antibiotics approved or get label claims or, or for, for drugs uh, approved. Uh, I will say, though, that we're not, that's, this is not by any means a, a quick process. And, and we're probably not going to have, looking at the horizon, a lot more drugs uh, at our disposal. So we have to make sure that we, we're using what we can in the appropriate manner. Um, and, and making sure, you know, husbandry and a lot of his other aspects that go into it is, is, is accounted for. So the INAD, and this is what we were talking about, there's, uh, there's a program that's called, it's, everyone will refer to it as INAD, the Investigational New Animal Drug. So this allows for access to the different therapeutics before it has a label claim. So the whole idea here is that you can, they'll, they'll tell you, okay, sure, you can use this antibiotic on your facility, against a pathogen it doesn't have a label claim for, with the idea is that we're gathering data so that way we can eventually get a label claim for it, right? Whether, so you're, you're helping either demonstrate the safety, the, the effectiveness, whatever that is. So there's going to be some record keeping information that you're going to have to, to report back in exchange for using that drug in a, in a non-approved manner. Um, there's, there's really strict protocols to, to follow in order to do this because it is you're using it outside of its, its label claim or if it doesn't even have a label claim. Uh, so there's additional record keeping and additional protocols you have to follow and there is a, a registration cost for the, the facility to do that. Now some agencies uh, or, or uh, academic institutions might pick up that cost for you, for your facility for, for INAD registration. I know when I was at Mississippi State, we had several farms that were on INADs and, and we would cover the cost of their registration for that. So. Uh, if, if you have an issue, and particularly the people are, you know, we're talking to at lunch, I, I encourage you to, to reach out to some folks and see what, what your options are um, from an INAD standpoint to be able to use, use those drugs. So the ADAP website, if you, if you, if you Google, the easiest way to, to find it is, is to do ADAP, the A-A-D-A-P, uh, F-W-S, so Fish and Wildlife Service. Because if you just do ADAP, uh, I can't remember what comes up, but it's some other organization. So do AADAP, comma, FWS in your Google search, and they'll take you to the website. And they have some nice uh, materials here. This is a, a free brochure that you can get that they'll send you uh, that covers all the different approved drugs in aquaculture, all the label claims, and, and even uh, sample calculations on how to, how to administer the drugs or the chemicals. So really, really good uh, resource. They also produce, so AFS produces, the American Fisheries Society produced this, the Guide to Using Drugs, Biologics, uh, and, and Other Chemicals in Aquaculture, another really good document that you can have uh, on hand, whether it's, you have it digital or, or in print, but uh, that's another common document that I, that I reference for, for our stuff. So I put this slide in here just because, you know, a lot of people, um, in the popular press, you'll see a lot of different things about antibiotic and antibiotic usage in aquaculture. And, and this is something that we're really sensitive to at, at Clear Springs, and particularly with a lot of the marketplace, you'll find, depending upon where you're selling your fish, they might have uh, questions or requests about the amount of antibiotics you use, what life stage of the fish you use it. Um, and and this, is, this is a graph from, from Norway, so to, to, to show the, the salmon industry in Norway. And, and you see, these bars represent the amount of, of basically antibiotics sold, right? And, and uh, this green line is, is actually production. So how many tons of, of salmon they're producing. And, and you'll notice this, this, this huge use, or relatively large use of, of antibiotics, and really that trending down to 
use at all since, since the mid-90s, despite what you'll read in, 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 in a lot of the popular press. And so you ask yourself, well, what happened here? Did the diseases go away? No, right? The diseases are, in fact, still there. What happened here is vaccine production. Right, so a lot of the emphasis what we're doing is, is, is looking at different vaccination programs and what we can develop vaccines both for viral and, and, and bacterial pathogens that we can prevent that clinical disease from happening in the first place that alleviates the, the, all these hurdles about getting a VFD and how we have to feed it and if we go through INAD and, and especially for you guys, right, how you get the feed that you even need and the quantities you need it in a timely manner. So it, it really, there's a lot of different things, both from husbandry, but also from a vaccination standpoint. Uh, there's a lot of research going on right now in, in aquaculture on, on vaccine production to try and make sure that we're, we're preventing those fish from getting sick to begin with, perhaps, and, and decreasing our, our reliance on, on antibiotics. Okay, so now to get to, to VFDs, uh, veterinary feed directives, just kind of want to run through, get some background on what that is. Uh, this is all based off of the Animal Drug Availability Act of, of 96. And essentially what a VFD, it's a written statement, okay, issued by a licensed veterinarian in the course of our professional practices that authorize you to use that medicated feed, right? So if you're working with a veterinarian, they have to be licensed in the state and it has to be through the normal course of their professional practice. And we'll get to what that means in a, in a minute because we have to establish a certain relationship and a legal relationship with you before I can write a VFD. So if you guys, after this, you say, hey, you know, next week you have some sick fish and you call me up in, in Idaho and you say, hey, I got some sick fish, can you give me some antibiotic? No, I can't do that. And that's because the law doesn't allow me to do it. Now, I still maintain my license in Ohio. Uh, perhaps maybe one day I'll come back here. But, but, um, but I am not going to be able to establish that relationship, that legal relationship with you in order to write that. Okay. And the use of that animal feed has to be in accordance with the feed label. Okay, and any of the provisions that are written out in that written, the actual veterinary feed directive. So, so if I, even if we establish that relationship and I write a VFD for you, I have to be assured that you're going to use it like I tell you to use it. You're not just going to take it and say, okay, well, I'm going to feed half of it to the sick pond and I'm going to keep the other half back. That way, you know, who knows, if a pond get, breaks again, I don't have to worry about calling Stephen or paying for diagnostics. I can just give him the antibiotic, right? We're trying to avoid that. And really, that's in your own best interest, too, because especially in your facility, if you start doing sub-therapeutic doses, that's where resistance is going to happen, and you're just going to shoot yourself in the foot in the long term. You might help save or might reduce some of the mortality in that, that current pond you're dealing with, but maybe five years from now, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to use it at all, right? Or it's a hypothetical timeline there, but the idea is that you have to be able to use it as, as it's written. So the VFD drugs are regulated by FDA. Right, so I'm not making up these rules. Veterinarians aren't saying, "Hey, we're going to make these rules that way. You have to, you know, you have to use us and or anything like that." This is all through FDA, and like I said, the driving force here is to reduce that potential for resistance, okay, and prolong the effectiveness of the drug. That way, you guys can continue to use it when you do have disease issues. Again, the drug is 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 used in the feed under the the supervision of a licensed veterinarian in the state. Uh, and it, it has to be, in order for you to use it in a particular pond or a particular population of fish, uh, it has to be authorized by that lawful VFD. And there's a lot of regulations as to what has to be in the VFD. You don't have to worry yourself with that. That's something that, that we have to as we write it. So what are the veterinarian responsibilities, right? So everyone's got a role in this, and everyone has different responsibilities uh, with, with, in regards to, to VFDs. So again, I have to be a licensed veterinarian. I have to establish what's called a veterinary, a valid veterinarian client patient relationship, right? So that's that legal relationship that I have to establish with you before I can even write that VFD. It's similar to if you called up your vet and you wanted, you know, antibiotic for your dog and they've not seen your dog in two years, that they need to say, hey, you need to come into the clinic so I can see it. They need to establish that, that VCPR, okay? So it's the same thing here. I have to, and there's different, different definitions of the VCPR. There's some state, federal, and different, every, of course, there's different differences between states and if they have their own or they defer to federal and, and so on. But uh, I have to have examined the fish recently, okay? I have to maintain medical records. And like in the state, the state licensing board dictates to me what actually has to be in that record. Just like you have your, your doctor, when you go there, they, they are required by law to include 
certain things in the records, I have to do the same thing. Uh, I have to ensure it's proper use of medication. I have to be available for emergency or follow-up care. I, it, in order to write a, the, the VFD, I have to issue a written VFD with all the information, and I have to maintain copies of the VFD for two years, as do, as do you and the feed mill that, that it goes to. So a lot of things have to go into it from my standpoint to protect my license, because if I don't have my license, well, there goes my livelihood, but then there goes also a, a resource for you to, for me to write a VFD, right? So it's in everyone's best interest um, for that. So what are your responsibilities as producers? If you guys have sick fish, you, 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 you work with a veterinarian to get a VFD, what do you have to do? Again, the very first thing is making sure you're cooperating with us, but you're supplying the necessary information. The law dictates what we have to include in the VFD. Well, we can't make that up, so we, we, we rely on you to provide us with accurate information. So there has to be a two-way communication and making sure that we have everything. You need to be following the, the, the dose rate and the duration, and of course making sure you're not feeding it after the expiration date, right? So uh, a lot of people get caught up on, on dose rate versus, versus duration. So the duration of use is the, the length of time that it's allowed to be fed to the animal per the approved label, right? So those label claims we saw before, if it's a 10-day course of treatment, it's a 10-day duration of use. You have to feed the antibiotic for all 10 days. You can't stop after five days. Okay, and the expiration date, that's different. That's the time of how long the VFD itself is legal for, right? So by default, the, most of the VFDs is, is six months. I actually, on the VFDs that I write, I, I have an expiration of a month. Because if it's a, if it's a, a sick pond and it's a 10-day duration, why are you gonna be waiting three months before you feed that medicated feed, right? So, and, and, and there's, so the, the, it's important to understand a lot of people confuse maybe the expiration with the duration, right? So the duration is actually how long that one treatment lasts. And again, you have to work with the feed mill. The feed mill actually makes the final determination of the amount of medicated feed that, that they're gonna send you. So again, they're gonna have questions for you regarding population size, pounds, you know, uh, how much you feed, what the feed rate is, of, you know, whether you're feeding 1% body weight, 5% body weight, you know, whatever that is. So work with the feed mill in order to, to have that information. So realize you're gonna be getting asked questions by the veterinarian and the feed mill, and, and, and having those things, those records written and easy to, to, to access is very helpful to speed the process up. Okay, and then again, you're required by law to maintain a copy of that VFD for two years. So make sure that you have a dedicated place at your facility that you can store that for because one year and 10 months later, someone can come ask to review your records and you have to, have, you have to be able to produce those, those records for the, the regulatory bodies. Okay, so in summary, we have very few antibiotics that are approved in the US, right? So a lot of emphasis now is based on vaccines and approaching vaccinology in, a, in an appropriate manner to try and prevent the disease. But also it's important to keep in mind your husbandry practices, right? And that you're following best management practices because stocking densities, right? Water source, all these other things that, that you guys deal with on a daily basis and decisions you're making can lead to that, that chance of the outbreak occurring in the first place. So the, many, the more things we can do to prevent the outbreak and that therefore eliminates the need of having to feed the medicated feed, right? Um, Again, veterinarians, were, it's, it's kind of a unique uh, role. There's certainly been veterinarians involved in aquatic animal health for a very, very long time. But here recently, it's grown tremendously. And so um, there is, please be patient with the veterinarians. A lot of the veterinarians don't necessarily have vast experience with aquatic animals. So you know, they're probably going to be asking more questions of you guys than they might with the, the clientele they're used to working with just because they don't have that experience. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the veterinary curriculum, uh, a lot of the veterinary schools across the country, they don't really include uh, aquatic animal health. So like at Ohio State, uh, I had a one hour lecture on aquatic animal health when I was there for the whole four years of the curriculum. So they're doing things to improve that and, and, and increase the exposure of the students. Um, you know, we have a good example of that in the back who's gonna be one of the, other, uh, the speakers, Dr. Flynn. I mean, he's a veterinarian, knows really a lot of stuff about aquaculture, uh, aquatic animal health, and trying to increase that, that knowledge of the veterinary students so that way when they go out and practice, they have some, some experience. Uh, again, before you use any medicated feed on your farm, 
you have to have the written VFD, right? I know it's probably not a problem here where you're going to get the feed before the VFD shows up uh, just because of the, the hurdles you have to go through to get the feed delivered. But make sure you have a written VFD before you, you deliver that medicated feed. And, and again, keep that for, for two years. So hopefully that fits in the, the timeline. Are we doing good on time? We got some time for some questions? Absolutely. Perfect. OK. So uh, with that, like I said, so here's uh, in, in the end of all my presentations, it has my contact information. Um, don't hesitate to, to reach out to me if you have any questions. Like I said, it's a little bit challenging from helping you from a distance. Uh, because of the, the issues with that and, and, and time, but uh, certainly happy to, to answer any questions and what we have today. All right, I am uh, Dr. Kathleen Hartman. I am the Aquaculture Program Leader for APHIS Veterinary Services, and uh, you're my people, and for better or for worse, I'm your person. Um, we have a team of one and a half people uh, that's working on the, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, that works on uh, our field issues for U.S. aquaculture, and then we have uh, one person that works on import-export stuff. So um, we're a small team, but I am very passionate. I believe in what you guys are doing, um, and uh, really appreciate Matt inviting me to be here today. Do we have any veterans in the audience? Would you guys please stand up? Stand up. Awesome, thank you. Just want to make sure we recognize the importance of today and thank each one of you for your service. So uh, I'm going to change it up a little bit today and uh, I'm probably going to fall on my face because we're being recorded. But typically when we talk about biosecurity and aquaculture, especially after lunch, I get the glazed over look. Uh, so I want to keep this as interactive as we possibly can. The National Aquaculture Association has kindly given me some prizes, some swag. Uh, so folks that get uh, some answers to these questions correct, you will get a fish-shaped uh, USB drive. Um, and uh, I also uh, I, uh, um, have some NAA uh, membership applications up here as well as some information on the Census of Agriculture. Please, please, please fill out your Census of Agriculture. That information is critically important um, so that we can count you, that we know the appropriate size of the aquaculture industry in the United States. Uh, uh, in a later talk, I'll talk about uh, the Aquaculture 2020 Health Survey that will be coming out. But please um, participate in these surveys. They're wickedly important. Um, for us to get that. Yeah, I'll mention real quickly regarding that survey of the census that's being sent out. Uh, someone asked, I forwarded an email that Paul Zajac had submitted uh, related to transportation and the new regulations that are going to fall on those who are transporting fish. Well, Paul put on there 3,093 aquaculture producers, so many pounds, and someone said that's under representative. I said, well, he can only say what's actually recorded and what actually shows up in the census. If we can say we've got 500 farms here, but if only 10 farms actually fill out a census, and that's what we know about, we can only report there are 10 farms in the state, or you know, 50 instead of 200, or whatever it may be. So that's kind of where it falls on. If we, you want to prove to be a strong voice, that's what the NAA is for. But he can't. He can only be as strong as we allow him to be. Yeah, please fill out. That's very important. It's also important um, to hear your voice that Congress hears um, how important aquaculture is in this country so that we can have the funds to do the work uh, that needs to be done for you. All right, so um, I quickly was in the back of the room changing a little bit of my slides, but um, there were a couple of questions that came up in the necropsy lab about the quality of samples. And I'll send my slides to Matt. You guys can have them. Um, but again, when we are trying to get an accurate diagnosis for what's going on on your farm, the quality of the sample that you send to a veterinarian or to a diagnostic lab is really important. Uh, and you can see top is the, the best samples are going to be the live fish. Um, fresh dead are going to be okay for certain things, but not for all things. And then our quality goes um, down significantly. So when you have an outbreak on your farm um, or you have some fresh 
sick animals, that type of thing. Those are the high power diagnostic samples that we want to be sure to collect uh, so that we get the bang for the diagnostic buck, if you will. All right, so biosecurity on your farm, why bother? What does biosecurity mean to you guys? Why should we bother about biosecurity? What does it mean? Right, disease transmission, so um, keeping animals healthy, keeping pathogens off the farm. What else? Yes? You're protecting your investment. Correct, yes. You're protecting the investment in the animals, in your farm. Also, you're protecting your investment in your clients. If you're continually selling your customers or your clients sick fish, they're not going to be coming back to you. They're going to find another source of those animals. What else? Yes? Some zoonoses, yes, there's few uh, zoonotic. Zoonotic means that a disease can transfer between animal and human. Uh, there are a couple of those, so we want to make sure we're aware about that and our employees are well trained. What else does biosecurity, does it make you feel good? Does it make you feel angry? Does it make you think dollar signs are flying out the window? Yes. Liability issues, exactly. And that kind of goes towards our investment. Well, when I think of um, biosecurity, I think first of all, biosecurity is trying to keep our animals healthy, right? And if we do have an outbreak of disease on our farm, we want to contain it so that we're not passing it on to our clients and getting a bad reputation that way. It's also appearances, right? We want people, if we have people, ag tourism is becoming a very popular uh, thing these days. If we want to portray or uh, give the appearance that we are doing things correctly, you want to have biosecurity visible on your farm. Doesn't always necessarily mean that the practices that you do are really going to stop transmission. How many people think foot baths are effective on an aquaculture farm? Very few, right? And that would be my response too. It depends on where they're placed. But really, in all actuality, I am not a foot bath fan. Um, and so, but having a foot bath at the door and having everybody walk through it and not do this, come on in. That's, you know, that's just our foot bath. Again, it's appearances that yes, we care about the health status on our farm. And we're going to ask you to walk through these things uh, to keep your feet clean, make sure that our environment stays clean for the animals that we're growing. Fear, right? You do not want to have this dump truck dumping out all the animals that you've been growing for years or a year into a burial pit, right? So disease and the impact of disease, not all pathogens are created equally, right? Some pathogens are going to make me and my team show up in a white biohazard suit. And other ones are pathogens that you guys are going to be able to manage on the farm. Okay? But it should strike a little uneasiness within you to start talking about the impact of pathogens on your farm. It's assurance that we're doing everything we can to keep those animals healthy. And it's a continuity of business. It is a cost of doing business these days. And our trading partners, I know a lot of you aren't engaged in international trade, but all, some of our domestic trading partners, state to state movement of animals, are becoming more aware of what farms should be doing on the farm uh, to demonstrate biosecurity and make sure that pathogens aren't being moved around with our aquatic animals. So again, what does biosecurity mean? Protection from diseases, it's an investment. It does do site control with visitor logs, signage around the farm. Uh, it requires training. So we'll talk a little bit this afternoon when we talk about CAPS, uh, that we really have to be able to identify early signs of disease. We, uh, Dr. Reichley talked about uh, health being a continuum, also Mark did as well, uh, that health is a continuum. And we, going from right to left, we're going to have life here, death over here, and we want to witness and catch all of our diseases very early on that continuum. What does that mean we need to know? 
Symptoms, what are the clinical signs of disease? Disease can cause both physical and behavioral changes. We t I think Mark talked about that in his session this morning. We're gonna see maybe the fish go off feed. Um, they, they're swimming in a different behavioral pattern. Some are clustering together and some are uh, distant over in a corner. They might be up at the surface trying to get air. They might not be reproduct reproductive as they usually are. So we have to know, and I call that, um, it's a, it's a producer instinct called ADR, ain't doing right. You go out one morning, you throw the feed out into the pond, and there's not the normal feeding activity. And if that doesn't make your sphincter whistle, it really should, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. So we have to be very intuitive. You guys are gonna know your animals the best, and we have to have that information from you and we have to have it as soon as we possibly can so that we can be early on in that process. For some pathogens and some disease courses, once you get to clinical signs or symptoms in those animals, it's too late. So we need training. We need the personnel that are working with the animals to know what those clinical signs of disease are. They also need to be trained in what? Remediation. How do we respond to this? How do we communicate this? What should we do? Is it just because it's Saturday or Sunday afternoon? Do I just leave it until tomorrow because tomorrow's a regular working day? Like we talked in our necropsy group about red light pathogens and yellow light pathogens. Which ones should make you stop in your tracks and address immediately? Um, there are some that fall into each category. Biosecurity means a footprint in your facility as well. It's going to take up space. It's going to take up labor. We want to do that as efficiently and practically as possible. If we don't, what happens? Lack of compliance. Correct. So I uh, work down in the Florida aquaculture industry, and we've got huge warehouses and uh, I, you know, walk in and everything's initially very perfect. The foot bath's full. They make me wash my hands. I sign the visitor log. And we get in there and the, the dip bucket is all the way in the back. How many employees are using that on a routine basis? None, right? So we need to make sure that our footprint for biosecurity is practical for what we're trying to do. We talked about, uh, Matt talked about quarantine and isolation. Uh, I have another slide on this later talking about that, but really something is better than nothing, but we really have to know what we're trying to quarantine against. If you're just quarantining animals because that's what your vet told you to do or that's what I told you to do, it's not gonna work. You don't believe in it, you don't see its effectiveness. You have to know what you're quarantining against, okay? Um, and that quarantine is going to have conditions around it. If you're quarantining for a virus, we need to make sure that the water temperature that those animals are in is applicable to the disease that you're trying to see. Uh, and isolation or acclimation is a, um, not as great as full-blown quarantine, but again, something is better than nothing. Give yourself an opportunity to examine animals that are coming into your facility. Uh, whether that be a couple of minutes or a couple of hours, um, just watch them do those non-lethal examinations that we did today in the laboratory. And of course, uh, biosecurity, cleaning and disinfection is included in that. What is super important about disinfection? Right, we want to make sure that we're disinfecting things from pathogens that are on there. How do I know what disinfectant to select? Exactly, who said that? Awesome, you're going to get a thing. Don't, I can't throw that far, I will definitely take somebody's eye out. It's right, it's based on the pathogens, right? So if, for example, and I have a, a, I added a slide in here uh, when I was in the back, uh, because a lot of times we think, oh, um, bleach is going to do it. Does bleach work for mycobacterium? Oh, good, you guys all know. No, it doesn't. 
And so if mycobacterium is a pathogen of concern for your facility, alcohol is not going to be the only disinfectant you should be using, okay? Uh, Vercon. Vercon is great. I don't work for Western Chemical or Sindel, but I highly recommend uh, Vercon. One of the reasons is, is that they've done a lot of the efficacy trials against a number of the fish uh, pathogens that we are working with in the industry. Plus, it's nice to the environment. I hear up in Canada they have a, a um, tinting of it, so if it's dark pink, um, means it's uh, got a high, nice concentration of active ingredient, or um, as it fades out, then you know you have to change it, that type of thing. All right. So uh, down in the lab, this is my favorite uh, parasite here on the um, left, um, is a trichodina. It's a ciliated uh, external parasite of um, all, practically all fish species. They come in marine and freshwater. Uh, you can see the beautiful dentricles in there. Uh, anybody know what the picture on the right-hand side is? Somebody take a guess. Protozoa. Protozoa is one guess. Could be. Some actually might look like that. This is actually an electronic microscope um, uh, uh, e electric scanning electron microscope something something. <laughs> I'm a, I sit at my desk a lot. Um, so this is um, a image of bacterial or viral particles. What do they look like to you guys? Bullets, Bullets. right. They're bullet-shaped viruses which fall into a very um, specific family of retroviruses or rhabdoviruses. Uh, that is actually spring viremia of carp virus um, there. And so again, my point is, is that not all pathogens are created equally. Uh, trichodina, we're going to see on probably all y'all's farm. It's everywhere. It's one of those yellow light pathogens where if we see a great number, we're going to have to respond. But if we only see a few, we're just going to monitor it. However, if we see spring viremia of carp, which is where that dump truck was dumping all those koi from, that's a much different type of pathogen. What's our priority here? Right, exactly. We are going to be way more concerned about this pathogen on the right because, it's, one, it's a virus. It's a lot harder to see. Typically, viruses um, have a much bigger impact on population health. Uh, we have a number of internationally reported viruses that USDA has to notify our trading partners if we have outbreaks of them. And so we have to be very careful with these. If you are raising koi or goldfish, spring viremia of carp should be on your list of targeted pathogens. If you're doing yellow perch, you don't even care about spring viremia of carp virus. So don't even consider you know, what you need to do to eliminate uh, that off of your farm, because it's not a concern for you. So again, when you're thinking about biosecurity for your facilities, Make sure it's targeted for the pathogens that you're concerned about that for the species that you are raising, right? Pathogens for the species that you're raising. Also, when you talk about your plan for biosecurity, you need to know how pathogens will move around your farm. Is it possible that me waving a net in your fish house is going to spread virus around? Yeah. It is. Uh, what about aerosolization from uh, a recirculating system at the pump site? Yep. All that needs to be taken into consideration and in how these things move around the farm. And then we develop the mitigation practices and procedures that will prevent that. So I've really, um, I've been talking about biosecurity for a long time. Uh, and I think I've finally come to a place where I understand it and I hope I'm able to communicate how do we set up a biosecurity plan that is effective, practical, meaningful? It's a hard question to answer because usually most people have glossed over by this point. So how do we do biosecurity? I've broken it down into three areas. 
We have to do risk evaluation, risk characterization, and then finally, we do risk mitigation. And it's under the risk mitigation that we start developing biosecurity plans. But we have to do the first two in order to develop a meaningful biosecurity plan. Is your biosecurity plan going to fit every facility? No. It's going to be site specific, right? Again, for the species you're culturing, for the pathogens you're worried about. So. Uh, let's see, so for identification, we need to set the boundaries of what your biosecurity is going to mean. Are you doing it on the lot of animals, meaning maybe one side of a indoor research facility, or are you doing it by pond? If you are harvesting, are you harvesting all ponds? Do you have different age classes in each of the different ponds? Each one would have different risks. or. Are you at the farm level, which is where I hope we are moving as an industry to get to? It's a lot simpler if the whole farm is a unit and the health status of that unit is all the same. If you're trying to manage pond A differently than pond C, you can begin to understand that it becomes very tricky to establish that boundary of biosecurity around an individual pond or an individual group of tanks. So we really need to think, and I hope if your facility allows that, we can set a very broad boundary. Also, you guys are in the business of population medicine. Typically, producers um, are not typically invested wholeheartedly in one individual animal. And that makes, um, Diagnostics a little bit easier because that the value of that one animal is a lot less than if we have the million dollar koi, right? And we can do a lot more things um, with that. So we're gonna when we're going through there, where are the things that where are the entry points or exit points where pathogens could come in or leave our facility? We have to identify what we call those the critical control points. Once we have identified those, then we can do a characterization of that risk. What is the impact of this coming onto my farm? Will Kathleen Hartman show up and shut me down? Or can I simply do a water change and that will significantly improve the problem? And finally, we get to risk mitigation. Everybody hold up your right hand. I state your name. <laughs> You guys are awesome. All right, so I have to keep things very simple. So finally, when we get down to the part where we're going to talk about mitigating risk, we have five areas on every aquaculture site that are common. Animals, water, feed, vectors, and fomites. Those are the five critical control points on your farm. Now, are all these going to be equal for every site? Absolutely not. It is going to be site specific for what your business model is. So you can design it based on those. And so we're going to go through a couple of these um, through pictures instead of words. Hopefully that'll keep you guys awake a little bit more. But this is, I actually stole this um, picture now last night, late after a couple of beers. But um, you can see that the impression of biosecurity um, is pretty common throughout. New fish coming onto the facility, that's a pretty big risk, right? Yep, absolutely. People coming onto your farm could be a risk. Certainly, veterinarians like to come in, lug in all of our sophisticated tools and equipment and drop stuff down into the water. Don't ever allow a veterinarian to do that. <laughs> if you need a veterinarian to come to your facility, you should have the tools that they need. And if you don't, you need to discuss up front how they will be cleaning and disinfecting that equipment. Extension agents are another really great one. Uh, you need to make sure if you are shrimp facilities, I don't know if we have any shrimp producers in here, but they are usually the most biosecure individuals, and you can't visit their farm if you have visited other farms that same day. So 
um, again, be aware of that. All right, so uh, when we talk about animal source, um, Matt talked this morning about quarantine. Um, he also talked a little bit about the history of source. And biosecurity should not be an activity that puts you guys out of business. That's not what this is about. It's about keeping you in business and keeping it strong. Um, for you guys. So let's discuss quarantine. We've already talked a little bit about the length of time is dependent upon the pathogens life cycle, um, what pathogens we're looking for. In terms of an investment for you guys, which is better, having a dedicated quarantine area with dedicated equipment, specific protocols for operating around the quarantine area, or are you a facility that has bought your fish from every, the same farm for 25 years? You dedicated? We can go either way, right? So if you're buying from multiple sources that you don't really have a lot of confidence in or you're not sure about, typically the rule of thumb is if you are buying from multiple sources, your risk increases. But if you have a single dedicated source of animals, you obviously have that relationship for a reason, right? You trust them. Their animals have been doing well in your system for a number of years. You have confidence in that. And that is a valuable component to your overall biosecurity plan. If you also knowing the source of those animals, which would come with trust and quality, what do they do for biosecurity on their farm? For example, we've got some tilapia guys in here. Um, I don't know um, their supplier, but I've been to the supplier down in Florida. It's a closed um, location of tilapia fingerlings. You're not allowed on the farm. Um, and he has his own broodstock, hasn't imported new fish for over 25 years doesn't do any specific diagnostic testing before the animals leave his farm. But a number of other clients up the chain and up the eastern seaboard have been buying animals from him for 10, or 10 to 15 years. There is a confidence in that. They're not mixing different sources. They always buy from the same source. So again, when we're thinking about how to mitigate this risk, mitigating each of these is very different. And it has to be dependent upon what your risk is. If you're buying from multiple sources, we should probably look into quarantine or isolation. If you have a dedicated source, let's investigate more about the history of those animals and where they're coming from. All right, water source. Now, the picture over here is uh, me with Jean. Uh, that's the best protected water you're going to get, right? Federal agents handing out bottles of water. Pretty, a pretty protected water source, I would say. Um, but aquaculture isn't like that all the time. I don't know if I have a pointer on here. But anyway, the other pictures are um, various different kinds of water sources, right? So up in the top picture is the site where the Atlantic salmon farm is going in down in Miami. It's going to be a huge indoor facility. They've, they're drilling um, two 850-foot wells, one saltwater, one freshwater. Uh, all going to be indoors. Is that a protected water source? No. Why? Because you don't know what could be leaking in from up uh, the aqua stream in the aqua. Great point. So when I ask about a protected water source, does that, I would argue that well water is a protected source. Is it super great quality all the time coming in? No. no. So what we have to do then, when we have well water, it's a pretty, there's not going to be pathogens or other aquatic species in there, right? So it's pretty protected against that. But we might have to intervene and make sure that the quality of water coming out is sufficient. Florida has high hydrogen sulfide, that rotten egg smell, which is pretty toxic to fish. So they have to degas a lot of times um, before the water can go uh, into the animal containment units. So I would argue, yeah, well water is a pretty protected well source. How about uh, this one down here is on a rainbow trout facility out in Washington. This is 
uh, the head spring water behind this fence, that is not their property. It comes in through their pump house and then just out of the frame here, it goes down and starts to go into their raceways. Protected or unprotected? Unprotected, unprotected. why? Exactly, and they're in an area that has high uh, prevalence of IPN. They've got IPN susceptible species in that head spring water there. Um, and so trading partners look at that and say, oh my gosh, no, we will never accept this as a biosecure facility based on their water source because it's wide open. Same thing with mollusks or clams or offshore aquaculture, right? We're in an open environment. So that's going to take a very different biosecurity strategy. How about this? These are some of the uh, thousand springs in Idaho. Pretty good water or no? Should be, right? <laughs> You're biased. <laughs> but yeah, that, that source water, it's coming straight out of the side of the mountains. That's pretty good water. Um, and almost an endless supply of it. So again, we need to consider what's my water source? How about shipping water that comes onto the farm? Yeah. I mean, I don't think I'll cuss because we're on camera, but it's pretty crappy, unknown anything. It's got probably a cocktail of drugs in it, and it's got all kinds of pathogens, plus it's really bad quality water. So you don't want to introduce that onto your farm. Feed, we talked a little bit about um, feed supply and storage. Those are going to be the two biggest um, criteria. If you're using live feeds, we need to make sure that it's clean. It hasn't been contaminated with Vibrios or Aramonas or anything else. Uh, if you are feeding commercial feed, record keeping is really important to demonstrate that you are addressing this component of biosecurity on your farm. This is an elevated trailer down in the Keys. It doesn't exist there anymore because the hurricanes blew it away, but um, they kept their feed in these bins and they would track uh, um, acquisition date and all those types of things um, there. Uh, fomites. Fomites are inanimate objects that we might be using around our farm. Uh, that we need to consider if, if our farm has different lots on it, we need to make sure that we're disinfecting this equipment between each of those lots. If we consider our farm our big lot, do we have to disinfect between each pond or each tank? Why? Between what? Species. Great point. So if we've got different species on our farm, different species have different susceptibilities or vulnerabilities to different pathogens. Some might be acutely um, susceptible to Vibrio uh, species or Columnaris, for example. Some species are more affected by Columnaris than others. So if we have a population, two different types of species on the farm, and we, one has a higher uh, predilection to develop disease, then we should take those. Yes, Matt. Oh, I'm out of time already? All right, all right. So again, we need to make sure that we're addressing all the different types of equipment that are moving around our farm. I would say, and I work on a fish farm, I keep telling those guys, look, our farm down in Florida is one unit. You can use, and we it's ponds, so we've got um, birds, graduate students, everything is moving all around the pond. It is one unit. We treat everything the same. There is no point in disinfecting the same nets between the different ponds. Plus, you can't, it's really difficult to disinfect a same net on the fly anyway, right? And so those are the things we have to, when we're considering biosecurity, let's not put unrealistic goals um, in front of us. So uh, vectors can be biological or mechanical transmitters of disease. They can be people, which is why we should be restricting access to our um, culture spaces, or, and they would be examples of mechanical vectors, obviously, um, or we can have biological vectors. In this tube is an argulus. 
um, that's like a fish louse. You can see them crawling on there. They make fish super itchy. Um, and you'll see the fish flash or itch against um, uh, sides of the tank or whatever. But they are blood suckers. So if you have a bacterial septicemia or a viral infection in your population, these little critters are going to be great at playing a role in transmission of those pathogens around your farm. So we need to manage for those as well. Or at least recognize that they're a link um, if in our biosecurity plan. All right. So what does biosecurity look like? And now we're just going to go through some pictures. Um, but this is out in Missouri. Uh, this, the, the white vats, uh, concrete vats up in the back had um, koi in them that were diagnosed with spring viremia of carp. You can see out the back um, with the blue cooler, that's my government vehicle. And I have, this was like my first year on the job. I have expertly created a clean line on the farm. This side's dirty, this side's clean. Am I a smart veterinarian? So what do you guys think? Not so much. Why? Exactly. But when we are talking about biosecurity and creating clean spaces and dirty spaces, we have to look at the whole picture. If you've got cattle, goats that you're using for grass control or whatever people use them for, or we've got dogs and cats or whatever that are on farms, right? But if we have a disease outbreak, we have to be able to control them because there are some parasites, some viruses that will travel on these animals and contaminate and spread that disease around your farm. For example, uh, a white spot outbreak in Hawaii. White spot is a viral disease of shrimp. Okay, so we import most of the seafood <laughs> that we eat. There was a, a, a um, dump that was located next to the shrimp farm. A seagull or some bird picked up the exoskeleton, flew over the farm, and dropped it in. They started to see mortality events. Um, divers went into the ponds to see. So I go from this pond to this pond. And what happened? Instead of being in one pond, it was everywhere. And when I go onto a farm and they've got dogs, and I'm a dog lover, but they, you say, you know, they're like, Doc, you know, this is, the, this is the pond. I'm not sure what's going on. And the dog's jumping in the water, splashing around. It's Florida. It's hot. They're going in there. They might see a snake or something. Jump in there. OK, well, take me to a pond that's healthy so I can see what they might look like. And what's that dog do? It's jumping in the water. That's a problem. All right, so we need to make sure that we're smart about what we're setting up. I'm not saying we have to kill all the animals. Here is a um, site that was down in Arkansas. They shipped their fish fresh dead on ice. What is, as a consumer, I'm a mother too, so my radar is a little higher than most probably. But if I come onto your farm, and you show me that this is your ice chest on the left, do I have a great deal of confidence in this? So what is, it's perception or appearances, right? So biosecurity all plays into this. Um, certainly this one on the right is a little bit better, but it looks crappy. The styrofoam's hanging out. Uh, it's better than it was, but it could be a lot better, right? So again, remember, if you're having people on your farm, which sink belongs to you? I see this all the time. Sometimes it's in my own kitchen, but that's my husband's fault, not mine. But again, look at this. On the left-hand side, we've got the hand washing. It looks clean. It looks like I might actually want to use that sink. Um, so again, I challenge you to go back, look at your sinks. Also, these nets in here. How do you think those get cleaned before somebody's like, crap, I need a net, I need a net? Right? We all know. 
Here's a shrimp facility down in Florida. They've got a, um, here on the left is their tire wash station as you drive in. Uh, you have to, as you're going into the animal containment units, what you can't see is a uh, submerged foot bath. There's the tin of Vercon down there. You have to wash your hands, the soap and the water's there. Dry your hands and then alcohol and then sign on the clipboard that's on the shelf that you have gone through those procedures before you go into that site. And the thing on the door says, if you haven't done this and we catch you, you're fired. That's an investment in biosecurity. And they have to do that because why? Because they've invested millions of dollars in a specific pathogen-free stock that they're selling PLs around the world to. They cannot afford to have breaks in biosecurity. Uh, would they like me to? Yeah, uh, it's shrimp improvement systems. Uh, so here we've got a house, um, and Stephen, this should look familiar to you. Um, Stephen did a biosecurity audit for me years ago, and uh, I still use a lot of your stuff, so thank you. Um, so this is one of our greenhouses down in Florida. The hand washing station is a lie. Um, so we walk in, and we have quarantine vats, new animals coming in. This was actually in a marine setup. And the initial thought was, before Stephen set us all straight, was that these were black, green, blue, were independent systems. We have separate dedicated equipment. They've got different sumps. Too close together, right? Cryptocarion, cryptocarion irritans, ichthyopterius multifilis, um, all those things, these stages can aerosolize for over three feet. So if we don't have plastic or some kind of divider between these things and we have an outbreak, is it reasonable to think that not everybody in that house is exposed? So again, we need to be very thoughtful and uh, make sure we're addressing this appropriately. Again, just general appearances. When I walk around a facility and I see nets in a bucket, I'm excited. Would I like that bucket to be labeled? Yeah. Um, but OK, I get it. But this on the floor, it just looks bad. All right, what's happening in this picture? This is from Arkansas. So this, uh, tr this alleyway is where their trucks go through. Um, they've got different stations, and the fish are loaded out from these houses on either side. In particular, what's going on with these nets? <laughs> are they? I didn't think they were that bad. They're drying in the sunshine. Is that good or bad? Good. It's excellent. It's free. It's very effective if it's able to dry the material completely. So never forget to use your resources. I often tell our farmers down in Florida, once you finish seining for the day, instead of rolling it up on the back of the truck or whatever, lay it out, let it dry, flip it over, hang it up, do whatever you can. The sun is a great disinfectant. And some, some um, viruses will be inactivated by sunlight. Uh, as well as a lot of um, bacteria and stuff. All right, this is also, how am I? You just talk. OK. OK, all right, I'll hurry. So this is another diagram that Stephen came up with for us. And I'll tell you a story. Um, have you guys heard of the chytrid fungus that affects the frogs and the salamanders? Anyway, it's a big problem around the world, and our amphibian populations are in crisis. In the ornamental trade, all of our fire belly newts come from Asia. We don't culture them here in this country. Um, I don't know if anybody has tried or not, but we took a look at that and thought, hmm, if we can find a 
fungus-free population and figure out how they sexually mature and then get them to reproduce, we can pro provide that technology to our producers here in the United States in the ornamental trade. So we imported uh, 100 fire belly newts from Asia and put them in a tank in greenhouse two, which is kind of above me there. And to prove that they didn't have this fungus, we swabbed all 100 of them and sent those swabs off to the lab. We had 10 dead on arrival. Is that bad? 10? Well, 10% of 100, but actually the, the, the importer had imported a lot more than that. So 10, I wasn't that concerned about. Um, plus, they're kind of fragile little individuals. Um, so we sent those dead ones off to the lab too. So we get the information back and they say, yeah, Dr. Hartman, you have a chytrid free population. And I'm like, oh my God, we can start this. We're going to um, see if we can get them to sexual maturity and get them to breed. And then they say, oh crap, by the way, we went ahead and tested for a couple of other things, but these newts have spring viremia of carp virus never been reported ever globally that newts could play a role in spring viremia of carp. Spring viremia of carp is an internationally reportable disease. We have to report it to our trading partners. And guess what? We had koi and carp on the farm. Guess where they were? In pond C2, where that arrow is pointing directly into, and I didn't realize it, but there is an underground water channel, so all the water from the greenhouse goes into that pond. Oh. Yeah, that's what I said, <laughs> except that it was a lot more explicitive. And so now I have potentially a full-blown outbreak of an internationally reportable disease on the farm. So we have to depopulate everything. Um, and so this moral of the story is, Know where your water's going on your farm and make sure your employees know where the water is going on your farm. How many times have we killed fish with bleach because we didn't realize that two tanks were connected? Um, so this is, you know, we have ponds on our farm that go to a, um, a retention pond and then we have some that go to a detention pond. And you'll see where my sphincter got even tighter, right? Because here, this water from those ponds is leaving the farm and going into a ditch. Not good. So again, when you're thinking about your farm map and biosecurity, know how the water is moving around your farm. Make sure you have signs that remind people that you are doing biosecurity and that you care. Make sure that the disinfectants you're using are appropriate to the pathogens that you're trying to disinfect for. Again, you guys will get my slides. Um, or you can call me or contact me. I'll send this to you. This is just a quick and dirty one that we set up for our Florida guys. But not every disinfectant is created equally. Are any of you using formalin as a net dip? Would you want to? Why? It is. It's a safety hazard for the people you have working for you. What else? It's expensive. It doesn't last very long either. And it's really a horrible uh, disinfectant, really. I mean, look, maybe for fungi you're going to get it, but for everything else it's like, nah, maybe. But if you're relying on that net dip that's form full of formalin to disinfect for you, you are missing it and you are wasting your money. So make sure, again, whatever disinfectant you're using, it's appropriate. Make sure you keep records. This is the other thing that I know makes you guys uncomfortable. Um, but we really need documentation. We need it so that we can review it and we know what's going on on the farm. SOPs, standard operating procedures, these are difficult to do. My team and I are very dedicated to helping you guys write these things up um, so that you can train personnel 
uh, make sure everybody knows what the procedures and practices are so that everybody's being consistent and uniform. Um, doesn't matter whether you're working Wednesday or Saturday, everything should be done the same way. And then train on it, have a biosecurity meeting for your facility, assign somebody on your farm, hopefully the most responsible, to be a biosecurity officer. Foot baths. So, like I said, I'm not a huge believer in foot baths. Um, they've done a study in an equine hospital uh, and they cultured the cement before the foot bath and then after the foot bath and there was no difference. Now, what is the power of this as we've already talked about? It's demonstrating that you care. In an aquaculture facility, you're not going to be dumping your shoes in a tank, for goodness sakes. Now, waders and stuff, that's a different story. But what I often see is here, this foot bath is in full bright sunlight, it's dry, so that's not doing us any good. Um, but then here we've got booties and the foot baths. Um, and so again, we have to be able to address why these practices are in place and what we are thinking that we're accomplishing with these practices. Are we doing the right thing? Is this the best investment in biosecurity? In some places it could be. This is actually a greenhouse down on our farm in Florida. I told them, get rid of them. Nobody's, nobody's refilling them anyway. Um, but at our diagnostic lab door, you bet there's a, um, a foot bath going in and out of there because it's more appropriate. All right, I think this is one of my last slides. Yes. So uh, this is a scheme when we talk about where should be, we, we be worried about biosecurity? This is a, a true scenario for some tilapia growers in a tilapia cooperative. We've got the source farm, and then we've got three primary growers uh, that quarantine the animals, move them to a nursery, and from the nursery, those will either go to other growers or they'll go into a different building on their farm for grow out um, to sell for a live market. So. If we're concerned about pathogens entering on grower one, two, or three, where should we be sampling the fish? From the source farm, correct. What if the source farm says, oh, to hell with that, Dr. Hartman. I don't care what she says. Um, what are you going to do then? I'm not going to test my animals. You guys have been buying from me for years. <laughs> right, and that's what they've done. So they quarantine their animals here for eight weeks. Then they move them to the nursery. If I'm grower four or grower five, do I want them to test again before they leave? Yeah, right? It might not be the same level of testing, but we want to make sure that whatever grower four or grower five are bringing in, that they're also healthy. It might be a different kind of thing, though. For example, if we were testing for tilapia lake virus, which is a globally emerging viral disease of tilapia, probably, if I could, I would test the source farm. If I can't, I would test growers one, two, or three, which is going to give me what? The reflection of the health status on the source farm. Um, so growers four and five probably don't have to test for tilapia lake virus if those guys are practicing good biosecurity, but they may have to test for Aeromonas, Flavobacterium, those types of things that are a little bit more production related um, in those environments. All right, so um, again, if you think you can't afford prevention by doing biosecurity practices, um, doing preventative medicine through vaccination, those types of things, uh, I can tell you, you're not going to be able to afford disease. Disease treatment is difficult, it's expensive, and sometimes it's not even effective. Um, so that's it. Thank you.